check. Pretty much there. I'm just going to adjust as we go. Start. Okay. Whenever you want to start recording. Yep. I'm recording, so go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Shane Hodge. This is July 29th, 2013, at the afternoon in the Computer History Museum. We have with us today the founders of uh, 3DFX, a graphics company from the 1990s of considerable influence. Um, from left to right on the camera, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. I'm Gary Taroli. I'm Scott Sellers. Ross Smith. And Gordon Campbell. Mm -hmm. And so why don't each of you take about a minute or two and describe your lives roughly up to the point where you need to say 3D effects to continue describing them. <laughs> All right. Um, where, where do you want us to start? Uh, birth. Works. Birth. Oh, born in New York. Grew up in rural New York. Uh, and pretty uneventful childhood. And, but um, excelled at math and science. So I went to school for math at RPI in Troy, New York. And there is where I met my first computer, a good old IBM mainframe that we were just talking about before with punch cards. So I wrote my first computer program there and uh, sort of fell in love with computers, so became a computer scientist, really. Um, so I took all our computer science courses, went on to Caltech for uh, VLSI engineering, uh, which is where I met some people that influenced my career life afterwards. So from there, I went to digital equipment and worked on VAX chips and, and tools and off to silicon graphics, uh, worked on uh, workstations there, mostly software and uh, chip design software as well, CAD tools and the, and the like. And then uh, when was it around the late 80s, the PC started coming into play. And so that's when I first met Ross and Scott. And, um, and uh, we started thinking about PC graphics and such, which was sort of um, a her heretical idea at the time, I would say, from the big workstations. Um, but uh, we went off to Media Vision. Some of them went off to Media Vision and Pellucid. And so then it became a reality around 1993. Were you at MIPS or were you directly with SGI? Directly with SGI. Okay. And were you in Boston this whole time? Or? Um, I moved out to California when SGI was just getting going in 1983, and so lived out here for about three years, with fond memories right across the street from here uh, in Moffitt Field, uh, on the other side of Moffitt at Clyde Court, so one of the very first buildings. How did you get recruited into SGI at an early stage? Uh, that was from uh, people I had met at graduate school, who um, after a couple of years at that called me up and go, hey, you want to come out to California? We got this interesting startup called Silicon Graphics. So that's uh, so it was the people I met, I would say, at graduate school that sort of influenced uh, my career afterwards. Um, and what convinced you to come out here and do that? I mean, DEC at the time was mm. a very stable and well-known company. I think it was um, somewhat of my trust in, in them um, and their recommendation and then coming out and, um, and meeting the people and just you know, wanting to do something uh, interesting in graphics, I think, also. That was the first that I had really gotten involved in 3D graphics. So. Okay. Scott? Uh, I was born in Dallas, Texas, and uh, moved when I was very young to Colorado, so I grew up in Colorado. First cut my teeth on uh, the very first computer in the fifth grade was the Radio Shack TRS-80 and programming in the basic language and uh, did a bunch of stuff for the school district. And uh, I guess we were pretty advanced at the time that we were doing a lot of the taking textbooks and, and putting them onto the computers and developing tools and teaching aids. Um, so that was how I first learned to program was back then. Um, I went to school back east at Princeton, and there I was an um, electrical engineer focused on computer engineering. So it's a combination of both um, VLSI engineering as well as computer science. And um, I, uh, uh, out of Princeton, I went to work for Silicon Graphics. That was my first real job, um, which is a fantastic um, breeding ground, I think, for, for uh, you know, learning engineering, um, learning obviously a lot about 3D. I did, um, at the time I was working on uh, memory subsystem chips for the, uh, the, the workstation division of, of SGI. And uh, met Ross and, and Gary through uh, Pellucid, which was a small startup that was founded by 
uh, some SGI executives that, as Gary said, left to start to uh, think about developing um, uh, graphics cards for the emerging PC market. Uh, Pulitzer was acquired by MediaVision, and then uh, from MediaVision, we left to start 3 Okay, Ross? I was also born in Texas, uh, although in Nacogdoches, which most people have never heard of, but and I haven't been back there since, but uh, went to school in Austin, Texas, uh, and got a double D degree in 1983. My first computer was actually a Cyber 7600, but it wasn't really mine. It was a timeshare system that the school had, and we programmed that in BASIC as well, and my first program, I think, was Tic-Tac-Toe, which I think is a very common thing for someone to program in BASIC. So I've always liked games and computers and the combination thereof. And after school, came out to California, and at the time that I left UT, um, you know, there was, really wasn't a whole lot going on in technology in Texas besides oil, and that wasn't very interesting. So came out to California and got in the defense business, worked for Ford Aerospace, um, working on satellites and things like that, and, uh, and also working on you know, big workstation products and stuff. And so ended up leaving there and becoming a consultant to help computer companies get into the defense market. My first client was Sun. Actually, my first client was AT&T, but that's a longer story. Then worked for Sun, and then at Sun, I met these people who were, had just left Sun and went to MIPS. And so they said, well, come on over and help us, and I went to MIPS. Ultimately, they made me an offer, and I got in the computer business at MIPS, and where I did uh, business development and marketing. And uh, MIPS was acquired by SGI in 91, 90, something like that. And, uh, and went there and um, met these crazy guys who thought that the PC was going to take over the world, and that seemed logical to me. And, um, and so we spun off a company called Pellucid from, from SGI, and the mission there was to bring 3D graphics to the PC. So at Comdex of, was it 92? Re really early on, we had a, a PC running real 3D graphics and, uh, and of course, we only had like, we had the spider application, we had the flight simulator, we had like three applications for it. And that was the real dawn of the, the notion that applications are really important. So Pellucid wasn't a stellar success, but it, it gave us a good grounding as to what the PC could do and set the stage for the next you know, effort, which became 3DFX. What was Pellucid's actual product? We had uh, the Pro Graphics 1024, um, which was the first true color uh, PC graphics accelerator at high resolution and high performance for the PC. The Apple had a great true color environment. The PC didn't at the time. What was true color in the context of that? 16 era? million colors, 24 bits per pixel. Okay, and the resolution? 1024 by 768. Right, and, it, too. and it had Rob, and, Rob to the and it had three-way memory interleaving because of the memory guy here, That's right. which has probably never been done since or before. Never before or since. Uh, and the cost oh, was it a thousand dollars? Yeah, it was about a thousand bucks. It was a volume product. Like, yeah. <laughs> saved a quarter of megabyte of memory or something like that. Memory was uh, really was expensive back deal. then. Yeah. Um, and what, when did you move from engineering to business development? Um, and I was why? at Ford Aerospace, and we had invented a, um, a high-speed network. Uh, this was 1984. Um, we had a 100 megabit per second fiber optic network, and, and I thought there would be some commercial applications for it. So I went to, uh, to the VP of my division and said, we should go sell this thing. And he goes, well, we don't know how to do that. Go figure it out. So I went and sold one. And, and that was kind of my first entree. And then, of course, after I sold one, they wanted to get rid of me because they said, what do we, how do we deliver this? And we don't have the documentation. And how do we do customer support? And all these things. And it was like, well, that's not my problem. I sold it. we got to figure that out. <laughs> so that was the, the transition to uh, sales and marketing. Uh, Gordon? Um, I'm actually from the other side of the uh, United States. I grew up in Minnesota. And Spent some time in engineering, spent some time in sales, and then in 1976, I decided I was going to try marketing, and there wasn't much going on in Minnesota. So I went out to Silicon Valley and I interviewed with Intel, National, AMD, and one other guy, um, and ultimately got hired by Intel. And I started their corporate marketing group for all their major customers and all their major products worldwide. Uh, from scratch, built that up, ran that for three years, and that was when Bob and Gordon were still running the uh, 
the company. It's kind of the Camelot phase of Intel, if you will. Um, then Grove got promoted and asked me to be to take over the marketing responsibility of our largest division, uh, which was non-volatile memory. And it was kind of a fixed assignment. And so I did that for two years, and I left and I started my first company, Seek Technology. And Seek was a non-volatile memory company, but we actually had the opportunity uh, to, in conjunction with silicon compilers and John Doerr and, and 3Com and Ungerman Bass, to actually build the world's first Ethernet chip. Uh, which was a bit strange at the time because it was a chip nobody knew what it was doing or what you would do with it. Um, took Seek Public, ran it for four years and left, and I started Chips and Technologies. And Chips and Technologies uh, is the company that set the standard for the fabulous semiconductor industry. And the reason it did that is that I decided, having uh, done the traditional approach with Seek, where you, know, you not only build a, your, your wafer fab, but you design your own process and you design your own parts. Uh, and that's just way too complex. So I decided that Seek would be a company that would never, ever have a fab. Uh, and that was a bit heretical at the time. Uh, Jerry Sanders is quoted many, many times for saying in some conference we were at, Gordy, real men have fabs. <laughs> um, so I ran chips for, oh, and then we also invented the chipset. Uh, which is how all PCs and Macs are built today. Uh, we did the world's first IBM compatible graphics controller. Later we added the LCD capability to that, which is what enabled laptops and everything else. The, all, all the chipset and graphics stuff we did back in those days is fundamentally what enabled all the smartphones, the tablets, the laptops, all that stuff. Um, then after running chips for about 10 years, uh, I decided I was going to do something different. So I decided I would uh, uh, create what was kind of an unknown concept at the time, an incubator. And I'd work with a lot of the other you know, new entrepreneurs. After about a year of that, I decided that that wasn't really working that well. and We needed really to have our own, our own fund. So we actually raised our first of three funds. And somewhere in that time frame, uh, Ross was consulting at one of the companies that I was involved in. And or I was, I guess we were interviewing you. Yes. Uh, so I was interviewing Ross to come in and potentially help us at one of the, uh, one of the companies. And it was the worst interview I think I'd ever had. <laughs> and so finally I just turned to him and I said, okay, your heart's not in this interview, what do you really want to do? And he kind of looks at me surprised and says, well, there are these other two guys and we want to start a 3D graphics company. <laughs> so the next thing I know, we had set up a, a meeting at the Tide House uh, and we had, over a lot of beers, a discussion which uh, led these guys to all come and work at my office. Uh, and that set up the start of 3DFX, and there, there are a ton of stories about all the things that transpired there, but that's, that's how this all came together. When you were at Intel, were you part of the Crush marketing program there? Or? Um, everybody was part of Crush at that time. Um, Crush was... I think it was one of the most amazing programs I've ever seen in terms of motivating an entire company to all have a single you know, focus. But what's, what I think is interesting about Crush, and it's not what you would read in any of the books on it, is that you know, the, the program was to go out and reverse the trend. Motorola was getting all the microprocessor design wins. We were getting zero. And you know, it, Dave House was you know, the guy running the, the microprocessor group at that point in time. And House and I would go in. I, I was the non-volatile memory guy. He was the microprocessor guy. And so we'd go in once a month to executive staff and <laughs> give our reports. And you know, mine was, was you know, I, we were hitting the ball out of the park all the time because non-volatile memory is that we had just introduced the first five volt non-volatile memory. Uh, and I mean, the world couldn't buy enough of them fast enough. But the flip side of that was that we were getting zero design wins you know, in the microprocessor world until you know, we got this one design win, which was the, the IBM PC. And of course, that changed everything. But you know, I, I don't think that we, we actually got that because of Crush. Uh, and as spectacular and as organized and as impressive as Crush was, I don't think that was really what uh, flipped that, that, that tide. Okay. Sorry for that brief aside. Um, 
So going uh, back forward to the late or early 90s where we left this off, um, sorry, Gary, were you still out here in California at that time or had you reverted to Boston? I was working back on the East Coast, so re remotely for Silicon Graphics out of the sales offices and such. And then um, eventually I left uh, Silicon Graphics and then did some consulting locally also. So what was the state of the art of 3D graphics at that time? There were several movies that came out in the early 90s that sort of brought computer graphics to attention. Uh, Terminator 2, I think, and then also Jurassic Park, which I know was worked on by SGI. Mm -hmm. um, that have any bearing on what you guys were doing? Um, I would say probably not because that was sort of at the high end and we were starting at that time to think about the PC graphics market, which was going to have to be really much more primitive than that and simple. Um, although the interesting thing that we always say is what we do in the movies, you know, um, with offline animation, we'll be doing in real time, you know, probably five to ten years later. And then five to ten years later, we'll be doing down on the PC level. Um, and then nowadays, it's like five to ten years later, you're doing it on your smartphone. So it's just a matter of time that it progresses down. So what was the state of PC graphics when you guys start, say, started Pellucid? I don't think there was a state at that point <laughs> in that time. It was uh, there, there CD-ROM. Was. Iris Vision. I, oh, yes, Iris Vision. We, uh, at SGI, one division um, had built an Iris Vision board, which was microchannel, I believe, in, in for IBM PCs. ISA. ISA, ISA yeah. and microchannel. Yes. And that was on the 486, I believe, it first came out. So one of the problems with the PC is that the 486, I think, had just come out. I think I worked on it for just a few months or a year. And the PC was really pretty primitive. So even just you know, coming from a workstation, it was just slow. But you know, within a year or two thereafter, the Pentium 90 started coming out. And then, then it just really started steamrolling in terms of the CPU side of it as well. But there wasn't. I mean, dedicated PC graphics that started there, I would say there was probably none. There was really none, and SGI was the first to create this Iris Vision, which was this massive board that barely would fit into a full-size ISA slot. Um, but SGI, of course, had no idea how to sell that product, because it, for them it was all about very high-end workstations. And, and uh, so part of the formation of Pellucid, the startup company that, uh, that we all work for, was acquiring the rights for Iris Vision. And so one of Pellucid's early products was actually trying to resell that Iris Vision product into the PC channel. And uh, that had limited success. Yes. Actually, really we good. sold them all. <laughs> we sold every one that was ever made. Uh, that limit, might not success. have been a lot, though, right? Yeah. I think yeah, there were four to $5,000 yeah, a pop. Thousand units. Yeah. Um, um, but they were very expensive, but, right? But the thing that was, so it was gross shading. Um, 16-bit Z buffer, maybe? Probably. And uh, no ten, texture mapping. No texture yeah. mapping and 10,000 polygons per frame or per second. Per second. It was, by today's standards, a software renderer on your iPhone would do a much, much better job. And there were no apps for it. That was the real issue. Is that for 3D graphics, there was nothing uh, in, that, in that time period. So when you guys were in Pellucid, were you trying to engage with app developers or application developers, or were you perhaps too focused on hardware at that time? We had no idea what we were doing. Um, in, in general, I think, we, uh, we had hardware, and it was becoming apparent to us. Um, we had, we, now, I wasn't the marketing guy. So the, the marketing guy is now a big success at Google, and shall remain nameless. Um, you know, we, we were struggling to find a market for this technology we have. And as we all know, that's really not a good way to, to do things. Typically, you want to find a market and then build some technology for it. We had this great 3D graphics board. We had a hybrid MIPS x86 workstation. Uh, and we had, um, ultimately, this, this true color you know, graphics uh, board. And, and for each of those different you know, pieces of technology, we didn't have any applications. We had a handful of apps. And, and so that was the, the real epiphany for me, is that whatever we do next, apps are really the key. And I think, you know, and there was good 2D graphics available in, in the PC space. You know, there were lots of guys, um, Chips and Technologies, S3, and other guys made, you know, 2D graphics subsystems, you know, and chips for that marketplace, but not much in the way of 3D at all. I think ultimately that's what 
allowed for Pellucid to be sold to MediaVision was this interest in this Windows accelerator market, which was really blossoming at the time. So uh, Waytech was another one, and you know we 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 had all these other products. This uh, Iris Vision 3D product, which wasn't really going along. We had this idea at the time also to um, um, take a MIPS processor and combine it with Windows NT, which at the time. You know, Microsoft was saying that you know Windows NT, which would run on all sorts of different architectures outside of the x86, that you could create very cost-effective workstation products based on the MIPS processors. And so we had a design effort to build this combination MIPS x86, as Ross mentioned, and and that didn't really go very far either. So you guys are really thinking of workstation non-gaming applications at this point? Well, I think a lot of it was we, we came out of, or, or, or at least some of the, the folks um, at Pellucid came out of the workstation part of SGI. So this idea that you could build a cost-effective, and I use that in quotes, we're talking something that would maybe be in the 5,000-ish dollar range, something that SGI never could build um, because, you know, every time they would try to build something that low end, well then the audio guys would come in and throw like $1,000 of audio stuff into the box and suddenly the $5,000 workstation is a $15,000 workstation and we saw this cycle over and over again. But it was definitely this mentality that you could do a lot more in a low end workstation. Um, and that was kind of a common theme at Pellucid is what could you do, whether it was 3D or this kind of hybrid x86 MIPS or maybe Windows Accelerator graphics products. That was all sort of in this common theme that, that ultimately... Uh, Value. Yeah. But we, we definitely were the classic um, unfocused startup, I think. We did way too many projects for the people that we had, but ultimately you know, we found something that worked in the Windows Accelerator, and that's what caused the exit to MediaVision. So how did you guys go from, I believe you described it as the worst interview you ever, can, ever did, to um, a new company, particularly with... Uh, sorry. Uh, pointing at uh, Gary being uh, in Boston. I imagine you weren't giving him, could you get him out to the Tide House to hunt beer into him, I guess is the well, question. Gary was, was working at Pellucid as well, and so he would be out here quite a bit. I, I don't remember the exact conversation we had, but there was a, another guy that we were involved with at the time who was actually a founder of SGI, Herb Kuda. And, and Herb and I, at Pellucid we had this um, a, a prospect come by one day looking for 3D graphics because, you know, while there was 3D graphics in the movies, there, there was the emergence of 3D graphics in video games, and in particular in the arcade space at that point in time. Was it Sega Daytona or Virtua Fighter? There were some early, you know, you know, pretty nice video games that had come out, and all the competitors to Sega were looking for an alternative. And this guy showed up, and we had a chat about 3D graphics, and he said, hey, there's a trade show in Anaheim this weekend, you should come down and check it out. So Herb and I trundled off to Anaheim and we, we saw what was going on down there and it was like, it was kind of amateur, you know, compared to what SGI had done and Herb and I looked at it and thought, well, this is kind of interesting. We, we might be able to do something here and, and then we kind of explored the market and there were apps, you know, because there were these games and people were really enthused about it. And so, I don't recall how we actually started the conversation about doing something along those lines, but it was to, it was to build you know, 3D graphics chips for games, and and Gary's one thing was like no cat. Whatever we do, we can't do any cat. So you know, and so the first chip didn't even have a line engine in it. Um, well, the the precursor to all that though was at MediaVision. After we had delivered these Windows accelerators, we were looking at what to do next, and um, I don't remember the. Um, if that, what the AMA show, right? Yeah. That's the one you're yeah. talking about before or after the MediaVision. But I do remember we had um, proposed a project within MediaVision to build a, a, a 3D game engine, a, th a 3D chipset, uh, specifically for games. And MediaVision was, a, was seemingly a great company to do this for because MediaVision was a consumer uh, company. They sold these multimedia upgrade kits and these high end sound boards. And, and you know they had the retail channel, and they actually had pretty good um, relationships with the developers because of all the audio stuff they mm -hmm. were doing with the uh, whatever their sound blaster kids. equivalent was. Um, so they actually made it made a lot of sense to actually build this 3D product as part of MediaVision, um, except there was just one minor problem, which was MediaVision was run by crooks. But that's another story. <laughs> um, 
But that literally, the, the fact that Media Vision almost overnight cratered because of the you know, financial system that was, you know, this is old school cook in the books kind of thing that, of course, we were completely separate, had no knowledge of this or any involvement. Wake Not up that we one, recall. One, <laughs> wake up one morning in the paper and you read about your company that you know seems to be run by crooks. It obviously everything changed right then, and, it, and we actually were getting resistance within Media Vision to building this product. It, it was just kind of beyond the scope of what they could really grapple with. So all this kind of came together pretty quickly. That Media Vision was crumbling. We wanted to get out of there. We wanted to start this. This uh, we wanted to, do, to build this 3D game engine product. And you know, we left Media Vision and right around that time was I think when we met Gordy. So th this was at the time in the consumer market then when a lot of PCs were coming without sound cards or CD-ROM. So you'd go to the store, you'd buy a box that would have a sound card, CD-ROM. Multimedia upgrade and, kits as yeah. they were called, yeah. You get your CD-ROM, your audio board, your speakers. Uh, it was some, a big market. Some yeah. CDs with some games and yeah. stuff. The, the, was it the X-Wing Fighter game? With a joystick, you know that you could fly down the Death Star channel, <laughs> but it was all pre-recorded video. There really wasn't any 3D graphics on it. So at Media Vision, we spent a lot of time trying to convince people what the difference between a pre-recorded CD-ROM game that had various, you know, avenues, decision points, and true 3D graphics was. Yeah, Mist was kind of the, mm -hmm. the paradigm of that, wasn't it? The Game that was on rails and rendered was game. Pre yeah, this is a pre-rendered game, and so we wanted to sort of free them from that, and that didn't play well with some people. Plus, the other thing is, 3D technology then was expensive. Like the Iris Vision boards were in the thousands of dollars, so that's where I think the arcade business sort of made sense because those machines were in the thousands of dollars, and they could afford graphics, 3D graphics that were in the thousand dollars. But the PC market. You know, that was, I think, out of the price range. Plus, there was no apps in the PC market. There was no, you know, uh, Quake or Unreal Engines at that time. There was no one was writing 3D software for the PC. So it, it was sort of an evolutionary thing. But the, um, the, the Media Vision, you know, going bankrupt was probably a serendipitous event because if we had stayed there, we never might have done what we really wanted to do. And that sort of forced us out onto the streets and you know we said okay it's sort of now or never right well, this I think is like I the perfect time shown the door uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is like the perfect time to do it because uh, this company is cratered and we can't stay here anymore so and, and it was an interesting fascinating time um, what was happening in 3d um, as Ross mentioned the PlayStation 1 was either about to come out or had just come out and that showed at a very rudimentary level, what could be done with 3D graphics with very crude texture mapping. And it was pretty abysmal quality, but the consumers were just eating loved it up it. and the game developers loved it. It sold out. And we had had some experience um, at SGI, either directly or indirectly, on a product called Reality Engine, which was a very high-end marquee product from SGI that they came out in the 92, 93 time frame, which as you mentioned, that was the product that did that, that was used for a lot of these movies and, and kind of put SGI on the map in terms of the of the of the Hollywood aspect of it. And so when we really looked at it and looked at the the architecture behind Reality Engine, you know, we believed that we could take a lot of the capabilities that existed in Reality Engine and bring those down to consumer price points, and you know, taking a much, you know, bottoms up approach, taking a much better than PlayStation was able to deliver with this uh, reality engine type of technology. Not that we used anything from SGI, but um, it showed us what could possibly be done using very deep, you know, silicon integration. And and uh, I think the other thing that was also kind of the aha moment, if you will, in terms of this is all possible is coming out of the workstation group at SGI, Gary was one of the first to realize that the microprocessor itself could be used as a very effective geometry engine. And in 3D graphics, there's kind of two major pieces. There's a geometry phase, which is very compute intensive, and then there's a rasterization phase, which is, is you know, you're painting the pixels on the screen, if you will. And um, SGI's heritage was largely you do everything in silicon. And um, so, for Gary to kind of pioneer this idea that you could really effectively separate it was pretty revolutionary at the time because it just hadn't been done. 
And we did it on some of the lower end SGI workstations. Yeah, my last my last project there was the Iris Indigo, which we literally implemented the entire Iris GL graphics library, which is now OpenGL, in software, except for the very last piece of it, which is just RGB shading. Um, so the, I got a lot of experience there on what exactly it took to do all these algorithms in software, and then. The chip technology was getting sophisticated enough where Scott could figure out how to actually build onto one or two chips enough that we could do a lot really fast, you know, on one or two chips. Did that become the division between you two guys? You did more software, Scott did more hardware? Yes, I would say so. Well, Gary did kind of all the algorithm development, right, where he and I would work together and, you know, Gary would explain what the algorithm needed to do and I would try to figure out how to build how to that do it. chip, right? And then Gary would say, oh, by the way, you have to do this. Divide, <laughs> you have to do a you, you have to do a division. Divide, how can we do divide it? Divide every yeah. single pixel clock. So, and at the time, that was a major, major Stumble challenge. block. Yeah. Uh, how to do a fast divide. I mean, it sounds trivial today because you get it for free in a PC. But in those days, doing a division was 20,000 gates, which was half your chip if you didn't do it cheaply. So one of the things I had spent the last year or two at SGI was how do you do things really cheaply and really quick and inexpensive, and how do you approximate? And I still do that to some extent today. So one of the things that my, my brain sort of gravitates to, so it was very well suited for how do you cheat, you know, quote cheat, and do something really cheap where it looks really good. That's why you wanted to avoid CAD, correct? Because that's not really acceptable in that um, Yes, yes. If you cheat, you can't do anti-alias lines and all the workstation vendors are going to come back and say, but that doesn't, you know, that, that doesn't cut it. And, um, and they need 24-bit true color, which was out of the price range almost at the PC market with deep C buffers. But the last project I did at SGI, we had actually 4-bit RGB. One bit of green, blue, one bit of red, <laughs> two bits of green. You would not believe how many people just laughed when they heard that. And then I showed them the images and they said, oh, oh, I, c I guess I can see what that is. But basically it was almost like the laughing stock, you know, of, of SGI, like four bit, but you know, you could double buffer it and it, and it was actually tolerable to look at. So. Because memory was crazy expensive then. Yeah, I mean, all we had was eight bits in the frame buffer for the, the low end prod, product, which still cost $9,000. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, getting down to uh, $100, $200 was a large step. Some of it took time. I mean, there's no way we could have done this five years earlier. So, some of it was just waiting for the right time with technology, right? And that's, you know, where Gordon came in it was important also because, you know, you had to build semi custom chips. And I don't even remember all the details of the technology, but we had to use as many gates as we could possibly do, but we weren't going to have 20 people laying out the chip by hand. So a lot of it was, you know, what's feasible to do. Was it just literally the four of you to start? Yeah, actually, uh, these guys all came and, and camped out in my office. And I think you were there for like six months. Yeah. And the, the reason it kind of took six months is that there was a mindset that this is going to be a motherboard. And it was kind of See, a, he always tries to hang that on me. It was kind of a mindset of three against one. <laughs> and, you know, I kept seeing these proposals to do this motherboard, and I kept saying, no motherboard. <laughs> <laughs> and so finally, after about four months or five months, I saw a proposal that said, here's an add-in card. And that, that kicked everything over the edge. And all of a sudden, the plan came together. We went out and did a bake-off to pick our VCs, uh, and everything started dropping in place. So I'm going to editorialize here a bit and say that current Silicon Valley VCs aren't particularly charitable toward companies that spend four months and not really having a business plan they like. What made you patient with well, them? Well, I mean, they didn't, I mean, there were no VCs involved at that point in time, but basically it was, I, I didn't, I mean, that was kind of a superficial perspective on it. There were a lot of issues that, you know, and I think Gary was touching on some of them. You were right on the cutting edge of what level of integration and how many transistors and what you could put together. And there was no way you could build a full-fledged, you know, CAD quality 3D graphics chip. And so what we did is we cheated and we, we made something that was uh, good enough, as Gary was talking, from the color standpoint and, and uh, enough polygons and enough everything else to be a, a game machine. 
So, so, so I mean, the, during that time, these guys are working. So we developed a full simulator that actually became really important to raising money because we could actually um, demonstrate the quality. Are you, uh, you going to talk about that big reality? That came later. That came <laughs> later. That came later. <laughs> No, but, we, but they developed, and, and they had in software, uh, it was a C simulator, I, I assume. Yeah, a complete the, working chip, in essence, in software. And, and we, would, we rendered these movies that showed what the quality would be, and, and we had several examples of that. And we had a Pentium 90, right? At yep. the time, a Pentium 90 was a big deal, with all the memory you we could, could find. And, and Scott and I lugged that thing across Japan. And on the subway, and Gordy say we have to be here, here, and here, because you had to go to Japan in those days. What was the reason for that? It's where the games were. The arcade games, right? Exactly. And, and, and consoles. Well, it, it, no, it turns out that I had had Japanese investors in chips and technologies, which is a different story. But So when the opportunity came to do something here, um, you know, we welcomed Japanese investors into this and got quite a few of them. So. That helped us both from the business standpoint and from the standpoint that you know we became more of an international company right away. But while they were working on the simulator, you know, Gordy and I, he was beating me up about the motherboard business plan, and we kept iterating. Um, was it a motherboard plan because you were focused on arcade machines and not computers? We were looking. The PC had no presence in the arcade market at that time. They were all custom boards with MIPS or PowerPC processors. And, and we were building a, a product because we ultimately wanted to get to the PC in the home. So it was a PC-based arcade or coin-op architecture. And so the motherboard was a way to do that. And finally, we, you know, through the keen insight of our leader, we, um, we gave up on that. So we can do an add-in card. And ultimately, we made it compatible with MIPS. The, the Midway and Atari game systems were all based on MIPS microprocessors. So it was actually, it was a good revelation because it was the same basic concept of a PC standard kind of architecture, but the packaging really mattered and how you presented it to the market really mattered because uh, motherboard companies had a zero valuation. The, the Valley's full of them and Taiwan was full of them. But this kind of special add-in card had a, a very kind of, um, very attractive nature to it, you know, to the investment community. Who were your first investors? Was it Mitsui? No, actually, it was USVP. US, yeah, USVP was the guy we picked. US Venture. US Venture Partners? Yeah. The, they were the only round A guy, right? No, I think we had a little bit in there from, uh, from Chase at the time, That's too, right. because the introduction uh, to USVP ultimately had come through, through Chase. We brought in um, Tony Sun right, from Ben Rock. Yeah, ben Rock right. was the other one. Yeah. Was that round A? Mitsui invested. I don't they? remember. Yeah. That. Maybe that was our first pitch, was to Mitsui. But it, it, was, it was kind of interesting because when we went out and, and we picked a small number of, of VCs, went out and did the pitch and, and came back pretty favorable. It was a pretty short process, actually. So what year was this now? Was this 94? Uh, about that. And what was interesting about it is that the, the business plan that we ultimately came up with was one that I think it's the closest business plan I've ever seen from a startup that never really changed much. And uh, there are very few startups you can ever say that about. After you fix the Excel spreadsheet error, right? <laughs> <laughs> what was the Excel spreadsheet error? <laughs> we had our first, I think, and I think our first pitch was to Mitsui, but we're, we've been pulling all-nighters for like, you know, days. We're at my little apartment in Palo Alto, and we did have a, a, a colleague of ours, um, a lady who's no longer with us, Alma Ribs, and we were working on this, the business model, because you have to show what the revenue forecast looks like and P&L and all that. And things look great. It was like, Jesus, we're just going to print money. And then we noticed that it didn't matter how we changed the cost, <laughs> that we always had the profit. I thought, this, something's probably wrong with this. And we found we had a big spreadsheet error. So we fixed it, uh, got everything in, done in time, and went and made the first pitch. But it was uh, one of those hair-raising moments of, <laughs> oh, geez. Went from a great business to it's a disaster in like, oh. <laughs> one form of a change. <laughs> What was the climate like for venture capital in the Valley at that time? I, I think it was, uh, you know, that was really right at the beginning of when venture capital blossomed, I think, in Silicon Valley, you know, culminating in the peak of the late 90s. Um, 
you know, it's funny, we joke today that it's still called Silicon Valley, but there's almost no silicon left in Silicon Valley, right? There's very few chip companies that get funded anymore. But at the time, um, pitching a chip company while it was expensive and you needed to raise a lot of money um, by the, those days' standards, um, VCs loved chip companies because they felt that there was a lot of differentiation, there was um, IP protection, high barrier to entry. So um, at the time there was definitely money available for innovative companies that were focused on, on chip technologies. Um, probably at that time saw a lot more chip companies than software companies. Well, I think companies. you're right on the, I mean, chips and technologies, S3, I mean, there are a whole bunch of companies that have been very big successes. And so I think the, the VC community, which tends to hurt a little bit, um, you know, was, they hadn't gotten out of the hurting phase yet. And have they ever? Um, no, probably not. <laughs> but the, the other side of it is that, you know, the, the, doing a chip company hadn't gotten super expensive yet. And so I think, you know, today there's hardly any appetite at all in Silicon Valley for, for chip startups. And probably rightfully so, because they're just so damn expensive. There aren't many markets that can support the cost of chip development today. So, you know, the, that was a different time and place. And, you know, I think everybody was still optimistic there were going to be things, you know, like the previous uh, wave of successes. And you guys were slightly before, probably about, what, three years before the internet wave really hit, and everyone was doing a web startup, I imagine. Is that yeah, roughly that, that, correct? More networking startups, probably. That, yeah. was, that was our big competition, was people, this was after we had gone public and, and we were trying to continue to grow the company, but 98-ish time frame, 99, um, just keeping, um, keeping our engineers, recruiting new engineers when Every Red other scale. building was yet another networking startup company that was, you know, being sold for a gazillion dollars. So that was very, very challenging at the time. And what were your guys' titles in the company? Gordy was CEO, correct? Uh, until we went public, and then then we brought in another guy to to take that from that stage on. I was VP of Sales and Marketing. I think both Gary and I were. CTO and chief scientist, something, or something, like, something that. like that. Yeah. CTO, software, hardware, or yeah, some some breakdown. Okay. So, but uh. and so, where did um, where did the IP come from to design these chips? Um, it seems sort of hard to just you know have two or three guys get together and design a graphics accelerator. I would say you know the basis for the algorithms had been around for. 20 years or 30 years in the flight simulation market, and SGI built them into workstations. And so, the, you know, how to do 3D graphics was, you know, sort of old hat. Problem is, how do you do it cheaply? So, you know, the, the, uh, um, in terms of the algorithms, there wasn't any new things invented. In terms of the implementation of how you actually do it inexpensively, I would say that's, you know, where the some of the innovation came from. I'd say that was um, this simulator that we mentioned before, this thing was just all software that Gary created was the sort of the research part of how we would develop all of it. And Gary would, would kind of map a, an algorithm sort of the right way Right, I remember yes. you had all these different, oh, yeah. different the right flags way. where you could do you know, full floating point calculations and do everything kind of the SGI right way. And then Gary would use that as a kind of apples to apples comparison against, okay, here's the cheap way. And since this was all about gaming and consumer um, use, there wasn't a ap perfect answer, right? Because it ultimately comes down to, does it look good enough? And that's very subjective. And so you could really go to the, to the extreme of when you can start visually seeing artifacts and visually seeing right. something that's not quite right. And then you just kind of come back slightly from that and that was a constant balancing act yeah. where we tried to make it look good enough. Everything had its limits, and so you know, even in some of the early chipsets, developers couldn't do anything that they they could do on an SGI workstation. You know, for example, the the depth of the scene because of the Z buffer limitations and other things, it was constrained, but it was that was perfectly acceptable for games. Right. You know, probably wouldn't be perfect for high end flight simulators or SGI like things, but 
But I would say from an IP perspective, a lot of it was Gary just sitting in the simulator Creating Seeing what algorithms. you can get away with, yeah. and asking Scott, uh, "Can you build this? How expensive? Because like, how do you do a divide? Right? It's well known how to do division, but how do you cheat? Well, do a table lookup. Scott, how big is a table? What does a gate count look like if I ask you for you know a twelve bit table, and then we're going to do some linear interpolation between it, like you learned in high school trigonometry? You get your sine tables out, and you linearly interpolate. That's all." So that's where some of the IP came from. That's how you basically do a cheap divide. And so Scott would go back and forth, and it's like, okay, well, for 20,000 gates, what can we do in a divide, right? And, it's, and how does it look? And what happens if I shave a bit off, right? And so you know, he, would, he would do the cost end of it, and, and I would uh, you know, try to figure out the algorithms, and then we'd look at the results and say, well, what do you think? You know, well, I can see the difference, but you know, it really isn't bad. You I know? think that the key that we had is we had a mission. And the mission was to build this game thing. And, and so you'd look at the pristine method or the most precise method, which is a full floating point or 24 bits of Z or whatever, and you start dialing it back saying, well, what can we get away with? And knowing that mission, saying the mission is for games, and, and knowing that cost was really important, was equally or greater, of greater importance than having you know, all the precision that you would normally need, that, that gave us insight as to how to proceed. And that, and that failed a lot of other companies uh, because they would try and bring the purest 3D graphics mentality into building their chips. Couldn't get there from here because we sacrificed all kinds of things for cost. And ultimately, well, we'll probably talk about this, we sacrificed 2D, which was, was very heretical at the time. We, we, we left it out of the chip. And you, you know, we were told by many, many experts in the field, you can't sell a graphics chip without 2D. You know, how do you run Windows? And our answer was, you don't. You know, we were only for games. And if you want to run Windows, buy that Chips and Technologies chip. It's a great chip for that. And, and the interesting thing about that from a chicken and egg standpoint is we were all about 3D games, but there weren't any. That's a minor detail. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing you brought up, Gordy, was that VCs at the time still liked chip companies because they perceived there was a high barrier to entry. Um, but if a lot of these graphics techniques were already known, and it was just the implementation you guys were doing, what gave you the confidence that you would be able to, you know, beat out a new entrant into, entrant into the market and, you know, stay successful? Well, I don't think anybody else was doing what we were doing at the time. The only other 3D graphics guys were taking the CAD approach. And so there really wasn't anybody doing this. Um, what was NVIDIA doing at the time? Or ATI? So NVIDIA was founded in the early 90s, 92, they're around the Pellucid time frame, as I recall. About and a uh, year before us. Yeah, they had, um, their founders were predominantly from Sun, Sun Microsystems, the graphics group of Sun, and then Jensen, the CEO, came from LSI Logic. Um, the architects from Sun had this um, very different way of rendering 3D that was, uh, what do you call it? Forward it? texture mapping. And quad patches, quad patches or something? or something, yeah. Um, and it was um, not a technique of um, development that really anyone knew anything about. So we took a more traditional yeah. approach, which, you know, as Gary said, there's textbooks on this stuff dating back for decades about when you're trying to create a 3D object, making it look 3D, you break it down into individual triangles. And the more triangles you create or tessellate an object into more triangles, the more realistic it looks. Well, there's another technique, which is what they use, which was this quadratic patch yeah, thing. Yeah, so something with forward texture mapping. It just was not terribly user or software friendly. Not very intuitive. Yeah, and not very intuitive unless you just wanted to write a game for that or an application. But, you know, there were some existing 3D libraries like, like SGI's, IRSGL, and other things that were sort of in a, in a different um, paradigm of how to do 3D graphics. So we stuck with the more traditional one. So what NVIDIA was trying to do, their first chip, um, they were trying to be more of a multimedia card as opposed to 3D. So they took, um, they had 2D Windows acceleration, they had audio acceleration or audio capabilities, and then they had this, this 3D-like capability, and that was what was in what they called the NV1, the original NVIDIA chip. And ultimately, um, the market was not particularly favorable to that. It just didn't 
this sort of a tweener. wasn't the best graphics, wasn't the best audio, wasn't the best of anything, um, and that you know they, they went down a direction that just uh, ultimately was not the right yeah. one for the time. So I think I think they were yeah dead end. Yeah, I would say sort of. So did you guys have what came first, your guys' first sale of your product or your first product being finished? We we actually had a we had a purchase order before we had a product, and then it became. Uh, in fact, we had this thing called the monkey. The monkey would move around the building a little bit. And um, we did have a purchase order, I think it was from Orchid, before we had chips. This was a physical, like, stuffed monkey, or? Yes, a physical stuck, stuffed monkey. And I think it might have moved to either Scott's or Charlie's office by that point in time. But um, the, but we had, we had a purchase order, and then we had chips, and then we had, uh, y'all probably remember the bring up, process better than I do, but I remember there was, it was a, a Super Bowl Sunday. Super Bowl, Super Bowl yeah. Sunday. Gary and I in the lab. Um, One of those proverbial all-nighters, I think. The, the architecture that we ultimately created was very different than the, the traditional consumer graphics chips in that we ultimately decided that a two-chip set was the right way to go. And um, you know, in terms of competition, you had the very, very high-end guys that could not figure out how to build something cost-effectively, and so they were almost by cost just necessarily out of the equation. Then you had the very low-end guys that were coming from the 2D graphics world, this Windows accelerator space, and this is again the, 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 the S3s and the Waytex, and they were trying to take a fundamentally a 2D engine and kind of bolt on 3D, and it was kind of pseudo 3D. And we found the sweet spot in the middle, but what we found was that um, by building a, a two-chip set, you actually could have enough gates to pull it off what we we're doing. And memory pins. I yeah. think. Memory speed at that time was very slow, and that was one of the keys to totally efficiently use memory. That's right. Yeah. So were these custom fabricated, or the FPGAs? Or? Fully custom. Okay. Yeah. Did and, you have uh, your own fab? What's that? Did you have your own fab? No, as Gary said, that's kind of what what Gordy really had had a tremendous amount of experience was is that you don't want to get into the fab business and Gordy had connections with with all the major third-party fabs and, and uh, TSMC uh, ultimately was our fab choice which continues to be the, the world's largest third-party fab I believe so Gordy really helped us steer us down that path so we didn't have to waste all of our time figuring out what our fab strategy was going to be and having to reinvent the wheel in that regard. How well did that work out? I think it was central to our success. We we don't. I don't think we ever would have been able to to, to build the company as as it was without this third party fab capability. Yeah. And, no, there is no reason to do it any other way. What would be the length of a design cycle? That not the design cycle, but just the end stage and having something ready to for the fab and then getting something back from it. Too long. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I th you mean in terms of when you release it to Fab and when you get samples back? Mm -hmm. I think at that time it was about four to six weeks. What uh, is it now? It's actually about the same. Think, yeah. um, <laughs> still four weeks, I think. And ultimately, it depends on now. Yeah, how much you want to pay yeah. to accelerate the Fab. But um, that, that part of the process actually has not changed significantly in terms of the time. But um, getting back to the Super Bowl story, so we had this two chip set, and one chip was what we called the frame buffer chip, and so that did the Z buffering and the gross shading, and then we had a second chip that was called uh, T Rex for texture mapping chip. And T Rex ultimately was kind of the real secret to our success was the fact that we could do real time, perspective correct, bilinear, filtered yeah. texture Six, mapping. Sixteen which bit text RGB textures and high quality, so the developers didn't have to jump through hoops. Yeah, and if you can't do texture mapping in a in a visual pleasing manner, it just it's almost a black and white thing. You either do it or you don't do it, and there's very little, like the PlayStation did not do it well, and you just would see it, and it was just, you know, I sort of understand what you're trying to, to show, but it just, it's very visually unappealing. Would, anyway, so. One of you guys mind explaining roughly what the graphics sort of process looked like at the time from, you know, start to finish sort of uh, verbal flow chart of it? Oh, okay, the life of a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> so, like Scott mentioned before, I realized at SGI that you could do a reasonable amount of geometry processing on the, on the CPU. So the Pentium 90 was out, which did fairly fast floating point for the first time in the PC. So we used that to do all the typical front end 
3D work, which was take your triangles and rotate them and uh, do geometry operations through 4x4 matrices, all in software. And then even set up the triangle. There's a bunch of calculations you do to find the slopes across the triangle. So this is very much like the wireframe portion. Yes, of it's just three vertices, and uh, you know you you um, you transform them, you compute them in perspective, and you do some other operations to prepare for the actual rasterization, which is filling in all the pixels on the triangle. And at that point, we literally send those da that data over the PCI bus to the first chip in the system, which is the frame buffer controller, which would sort of do some more processing on it, and then. We would uh, convert it into scan lines from top to bottom and, and, and goes across and keeps the other chip busy doing a texture mapping. It says, okay, I'm working on this scan line. And it's been such a long time, I'm having a hard time remember how they kept in sync. But, um, you know, they basically just went through it and uh, the texture mapping guy would give the texture mapping pixels back and then it put them together and do the frame buffer stuff. Uh, hidden surface removal in the Z buffer and alpha alpha blending we did yeah. we did alpha blending on the first yep, chip first right yep. yes so we did a lot of things that other people who were trying to do twenty dollar chips coming up from the bottom would not do because that's too many gates it's too expensive but we had a million transistors on each chip it was more expensive but we could do enough of the bare bones minimum that it could do like real you know SGI type style graphics for cheap so you were using the PCI bus on the card between your chips as well as? No, oh, not oh. between the chips, just uh, between the Pentium CPU and, and our card. Okay. And then on the chip it was all custom. Yeah, so there was the, this frame buffer controller chip, the FBI chip as we call it, frame buffer interface, that had the uh, PCI connection so that the, the, the CPU would calculate the, the triangle coordinates and send down commands to the FBI chip. There was a private bus between the FBI chip and the T-Rex chip that was just used in a, a proprietary protocol because you didn't need an industry standard one there. So we created this very high speed, um, uh, it's pretty novel actually, to be able to get the amount of bandwidth actually out of the number of pins that we had available. Um, and then the texture mapping chip had four memory channels, which was important right. because in order to do bilinear texture mapping, which is basically when you look up a texture, you're looking up its four surrounding neighbors and taking a weighted average of those four, that creates a much more visually appealing um, texture map result. Um, so again, having those four memory channels on the texture mapping chip was a critical piece of being able to do this in a performant way. You would do this look up, do the blending of these four texture elements and then pass that back to the frame buffer controller that would then render that into the, into the frame buffer. So it sounds sort of the uh, running theme is that memory was your main limitation throughout. Memory bandwidth. Um, I mean, there was an absolute memory cost issue, but memory bandwidth was really the major issue. And you know, even in today's and, world, that's still the same yeah, issue. And different, and different interleaves, I think, because people coming up from the PC market had a chip that had memory out there, and that was it. And they just used it for doing all this stuff. And what, what was innovative about our design was because this chip wasn't doing traditional 2D graphics, we could do anything with the memory we wanted. And so Scott did a lot of innovative things. You had two different interleaves, two or three for the frame buffer controller, one for the Z buffer and one for the color, and then four way on the texture mapping. Because we set the bar a little higher, we said we want to do all these nice features, inexpensively but still fast. We're not going to sacrifice too much performance. And that required six different memory interleaves across the two chips where most people had one. Um, it required additional cost as well, but it was still, you know, sub thousand dollars. I mean, they, our memory bandwidth that we had at the time was possibly an order of magnitude more yeah. than other people. Uh, and that's why we could achieve things that no one else could do. So <clears throat> when you had your first purchase order, how big had the company grown to at that time? And, and when was this, I guess? I, well, chips came back Super Bowl 95, must have been, right? Yes, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting us. Oh, no, 96. Story. 96, I believe. We were founded, we sort of got together in 94, right? I was working on, I was living in the East Coast, but I would fly out here for two weeks, and Scott would come back there for a week or two. So I was commuting, and they were working out here in various offices and living rooms and such. But then we got funded in, I think, I think January, March. from March yeah. of 95. Yeah, right. 
and then proceed to kick it in high gear because now we could pay off all our credit card loans that we had used to float the company for and six months. People. And we could hire employees that we could pay. Um, and so then we taped out in the fall, October, November, yeah, December, must have been, because Super Bowl 96 was when the chips came back a couple of days before. And then we cord called Gordy up at 3 a.m. in the morning. And said, we're celebrating. Well, Time so to see him. <laughs> well, we, we got the, uh, uh, because we had to tape out two different chips, we got the FBI chip back first, oh, that's the right. frame buffer chip. And um, we keep talking about the simulator that, that Gary had written. So Gary had this ability to, um, instead of doing all the rendering in pure software simulator, he could, in essence, strip all that out and send the real commands down to the actual graphics. So when uh, we got the hardware back, pretty quickly we could um, actually do something interesting with it. And um, one of the demonstrations that we used for a long, long time was this flight simulator that Gary had worked on actually at SGI and uh, had evolved uh, from then. We'd used the flight simulator a lot in these VC pitches to show what, what this thing could do. So Gary and I were in the lab on this Super Bowl day and something was not right and we, would, we were debugging the C simulator as it sending the right thing to the chip and whatever, whatever. And, Finally, we, you know, we were doing it step by step, and you could almost see individual pixels being drawn or individual triangles being drawn. And, um, we, and we said, well, you know what? Maybe that we actually have this right. Just, just let it run. And Gary removed all the debug statements or something, and the and thing it just it took off, and you could see the flight on the screen and the whole thing. It's like, oh my god, it it's works. actually working. And that was, uh, that was a very exciting time for us. Do you remember how big you were by that point? Pretty small still. Yeah, we're still tiny. 12, yeah. 15 people maybe. Yeah. And so, so interesting, after we got to, we had been using simulations to show what, what this is going to be when we eventually got it. So it was, it was hard trying to tell customers as well as investors and everybody else what 3D on a PC was. And, you know, they were used to these big SGI workstations and to a lesser degree maybe the PlayStation, but you know, it, people just didn't know what it was. And so after we, we got the chip back, I said, okay, what we need to do is we need to program up uh, a real-time 3D environment. And the thought process was that we would actually do a presentation in 3D. And so I still remember the, the, the first attempt at this was we basically simulated a, a cubicle. And basically, we were running a PC on a projector. And I could fly around the cubicle in real time. And we turned the cubicle into a financial presentation. So I think it was the Hamburg and Quist uh, financial conference. And I, I still remember it because there was this great comparison. McCracken, who was running SGI, was upstairs in the ballroom. And he had an $80,000 SGI workstation giving a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> which incidentally crashed about three quarters of the way through. I was down in the basement in a little tiny room <clears throat> with a PC and a projector and our first chip and on a card. And I was flying around this cubicle in real time and giving you know, a presentation. And people were kind of blown away. They were all going, you got to see this, and <laughs> dragging people in and all kinds of things. But, you know, the, the comparison between this little tiny startup who is actually doing something really neat in the basement versus SGI who is just doing another PowerPoint up in the ballroom, uh, just always, you know, you think about that and you go, you know, it, things aren't always what they appear. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And then it, we took that even a step further. Uh, after, you know, we had, you know, been fairly well along in the revenue ramp and we were, uh, we were taking the company public, the, the cubicle had changed. Uh, the road show that we, that we went on, on the IPO tour with is we had, they have folding screens that are eight feet by eight feet that you, know, you can pretty easily uh, pop up for trade shows. So we took three of those. So we had a screen that we set up in the front of the room that was eight feet high and 24 feet wide. We had three projectors that were all synced together. And we created a simulation of our, you know, our, our, 
plant. And so the, the way this worked is you drove up in a parking lot in a red Ferrari, and, and because it was eight by 24 feet, it looked like it was actual size. And then you got out and you walked in, you walked through the doors, you were in the lobby, and you know, it, the, the environment went right with you. And then every room in the, in the plant was a different part of our pitch until you got out in the back and you saw all the 3DFX boxes being loaded up and shipped out. Now, when we did this in Tokyo, because we did a, we did a tour through Japan, Europe, and the US, when we did it in Tokyo, the way we closed it is on an eight by 24 foot screen, we had one of these giant wheel space stations that rotates. And this thing was just rotating slowly up there and spaceships were coming in and going out. And everybody's going like this. Now, in a financial presentation, what happens usually is you have people come running in late, you give the presentation, and lots of times they leave before you're even done. So they're all sitting here watching the space station, and I got up and I said, thank you very much for coming. The presentation is over. Thank you very much. And walked off, and they're all just going. <laughs> and I, went, I said, the presentation is over. Thank you very much. Uh, and they're still sitting there like this. And finally, I said, OK, kill the projectors. <laughs> and, and everybody's going, what happened? Where'd it go? But it was, it was probably the most unusual road show I've ever seen. And it was graphically dramatic. I mean, you, you could not help but understand what our product was uh, when we started doing presentations like that. So when you guys started with the road show, were you still in the arcade mode? Were you? in the arcade mode, but going toward the PCs, what was the status? The, I mean, something happened along the way, which was the price of memory fell through the floor. When we were first doing the business model, I think we anticipated initial graphics boards were going to be like a thousand bucks. And by the time we had silicon, we were using EDO memory, right? Yep. Yeah. It had gone from a hundred bucks a megabyte or something, or I can't recall what the numbers were, but to something like like, hey guys, we could actually have a consumer product here. And by the time we got to market, uh, what were the orchid boards, maybe 250 or 300 bucks? Yeah. You know, it, it became very plausible for us to be in the consumer market much earlier than we had anticipated. And so by the time we, we went public, you know, our revenues were dominated by consumer business, not arcade business. The arcade was a very important component because it legitimized what we were doing. What were your first customers in the arcade uh, space? I think it was Midway, wasn't it? Midway, we had Capcom, we had Taito, Taito uh, Konami. Do you remember what the first game was out that had 3D effects? Was it San Francisco Rush? SF Rush. San Francisco was Rush. Uh, Gretzky Hockey, was that the yeah. early one? I think uh, so. NFL Blitz. NFL Blitz. Um, Midway did a lot of games. Yeah. yeah. You can still see them, you know, Shoreline Theater over here. Sometimes you'll see a, a Midway game. It Arctic Thunder was a good game. Yeah. yeah. Um, Hydro Thunder. Hydro Thunder. Arcades were still fairly viable at this time, correct? It's a six billion dollar market when we started. At, at the time, it, it, it became a zero billion dollar market. <laughs> you know, by the time I had a business focused on that, um, <laughs> note to self. Um, but uh, it, was, it was. We used to say that the arcade market was bigger than the movie market. It was. It was. Uh, but it was changing dramatically. The PlayStation and the consoles just killed it. The fact that you could get good, you know, equivalent content at home. Uh, and, and the arcade guys didn't keep up. I mean, they were still really focused on being hardware guys, and they should have transitioned to being in software companies, because that's what, that, that, that was their real value proposition. So what did you do on, when you started moving into the PC market, what did you do to get applications on the platform? That's possibly, at least in my opinion, the single most important thing that we did, which was connecting with the, the developers early, early on and evangelizing them. And that was very, that was very radical for a, you know, a graphics company to be doing that because normally you would just use whatever API Microsoft published or whatever and you'd build this hardware and hope for the best. We couldn't do that because there were no APIs. We actually, we approached Intel. To, they had a, a, a rendering library called 3DR and uh, it, was, it was a great library. Uh, but we, we told them, look, we need this for our graphics board. Uh, but we have to run DOS because, you know, in those days, you know, Windows had really become mainstream, but games were all still on DOS. And we said, we have to add DOS. And Intel said, well, you can have it, but you can't run DOS. 
and who else? I think did we approach Microsoft for? We probably talked to every API guy out there. We couldn't do OpenGL because we had no CAD, um, and so it, you know we we crafted our own API, and it was really simple. It was called, we called it Glide, and um, and we went out and and pitched it to game developers, and we would take the we take the before we even had chips, we would go on the road and we take the renderer, the box, and we show it to people, and, uh, and they go. Well, yeah, if you could build that, we might be interested. And then I think, um, and actually, that we bought a couple of reality engines, uh, if y'all remember that. From SQI. Yeah, we did. Um, Corey loved that. Quarter million dollar. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and we built, but we built an emulator, basically. We, we throttled down the performance of the SGI machines to match what we could do in the real hardware. And we gave that to a couple of key developers, and we had one internal one as well, and, and we, we had, you know, by the time we had silicon, we had content. And that was really, and we had, we had software that we gave to developers. We did, we did all kinds of developer stuff. Yeah, I think we did, we did a lot of things, I think, kind of the right way, which now seems sort of obvious, but um, at the time, the chip companies were not developing their own APIs. As, as Ross said, it was largely just sort of build to what Microsoft says you should do. And so we created our own API, which was a, um, we got sort of rave reviews about the, the level of interface. It wasn't super high level, but it wasn't so low level. You were programming registers and things like that. So Glide was a very popular interface that people use, but we also hired graphics artists and, and demo guys, you know, basically game developer types that worked for us that would just crank every day some new demo. And as Gordy mentioned, that those were the guys that did this great financial presentation but what we ultimately delivered when we had the hardware was you know, a developer kit that had, of course, all the, the ways for the developer to interface their games to the hardware, but this set of demos that you know, th they could just see, and, they, and then that, what that showed them was the possibilities of what they could do with the hardware. And I think that was really, really important to, um, to show the possibilities, because you can't just read about this and say, oh yeah, and if you do texture mapping, then you can do this. I mean, until you see it, you just can't appreciate it. So I think that was a great decision to, to spend. We spent spend a bunch of our money on that, yeah, that was in, in time. We, we had a, it, there was an interesting anecdote. We went to Japan on one of our first trips and it was all about fighting games. And we didn't have a fighting game demo. And I, mean, I think it was Scott and me, I think Scott and I were the road warriors at that time. And um, we came back and uh, we said we have to have a fighting game demo. And how do we do that? And we, we actually built one that became very, very popular with our developers. And one of our, some, some of our game developer guys went on to become really, you know, big deal in the game industry. But we did the, the Anubis on That's Gary's game. shirt was this game demo we did called Valley of Raw, which had a reflection mapped Anubis. So you could see the environment around him as he's fighting, what was he fighting? Something, some, I can't recall now. But it was a really cool game demo, and it lit up a bunch of developers, including the Japanese. I mean, everyone knew that you could do a high, you know, something as good or better than anything Sega had, you know, on the chipset. And we had that. We had flight simulators, and we had underwater scenes, and all kinds of things that showed the special effects you could do. And the thing that we like to say about the architecture is that, you know, there were no apologies. You know, you right. could turn everything on on our chip, and, and you would still sustain high performance. And with every, everyone else's chip, because they didn't have the memory bandwidth, if you turned on this or turned on that, the performance would degrade. And in games, if you can't sustain the performance, 30 hertz or 60 hertz, depending on what the game is, it's not playable. And so the fact that you have all these features that you can't use, who cares? So I think that was really essential is showing the game developers these, these features and them knowing that they could use them without penalty became very important to us. How important was it to your performance that you decided to build a card that was 3D only? I, I think it would have been exceedingly difficult um, to try to do both, and, and that was a big value differentiation for us for a long time was not worrying about all the 2D stuff. And you know, as we said, the the 2D guys that were trying to come up from that kind of legacy architecture and and add 3D, we would clobber them. They didn't have enough gates, they didn't have enough memory bandwidth, and um, you know, we loved to do side-by-side -side comparisons because it was just a joke. 
Um, most of our side-by-side -side comparisons were actually on this $250,000 reality engine that we bought. And, you know, like this Valley of Raw demo, we had it running on both. <clears throat> and you would sit and stare at this thing and you could not tell the difference. It was really remarkable. Some, you know, PC graphics board that was, you know, that big compared to some monster reality engine. And, uh, you know, that was, that was a really cool thing to show. Um, did you have difficulty selling? I understand the original version of the 3D FX card physically sort of clunked when it was, you know, flipping relays. That was a feature. Because <laughs> you knew it was time to have fun. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and to Scott's point about the 2D, 3D thing, part of that was because we, we didn't have, you know, in, internal to the team, we didn't have a strong VGA capability. You know, and we ended up licensing that, I think, didn't we? We eventually yeah. built it, but... Um, but the problem with that is that you don't get paid for it. If we had put 2D in our chip and WordPerfect 2.6 didn't run flawlessly, people would return those boards to fries because mm -hmm. WordPerfect doesn't work. But we, we wouldn't get paid an extra dime for that. Whereas if we focused on games, it's pure value. And so people would buy our board to play Quake or Tomb Raider or Virtuous Soccer or whatever it was because that game you know, really made them happy. And so that clunk thing was the 2D, 3D pass-through. We had a relay on the board, and you would, you know, you'd put your 3D graphics board, your, your Voodoo board into the slot, and you'd cable over to it, and then you'd cable from it to the monitor. And when you played a game, there was this click, and the 3D FX, you know, logo would spin, and it was time to fight something, or, you know, chase something, or, you know, fly something. And people love that. Excuse this uh, spot to take a quick break, and... Sure. So the point I'm making here is about scalability, which is we took it to new levels. <laughs> All right, we're recording. All right, we're reconvening after a break with some props this time. Uh, the panelists will describe them at the appropriate points. Uh, one of the original 3D effects boxes, uh, quad uh, board system, another board in the back I can't see, and apparently an iPhone, which I didn't realize no. that 3D effects yeah. created. <laughs> but, um, this has about the performance, probably, of Voodoo 2, maybe? I don't know, actually, what's in there. It's in Power Beer. I've lost yeah. track. Yeah. Or yeah. more. I mean, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it probably has better know, geometry performance. Where, where things have come. So one of the things we sort of skipped over, uh, PCs at the time were transitioning from, I believe it was the ISA, e ISA bus, over to the PCI, and I think Visa, VL service? bus, the VL bus, the Visa local dreaded bus. VL yeah. bus. Yeah. So, how did these buses impact you guys? Well, given that we had a software geometry pipeline, we had to take the the geometry work that the processor had done and move it over to the frame buffer chip, which which meant we had bus traffic. And the PCI bus at the time was was a great inflection point for us because it was significantly faster and lower latency than the precursor buses. And, and that was another thing that made it important for us, you know, at, at the time, because it gave, we had, a, we had a, a faster processor that could do floating point, which was important to us. We now had this uh, better bus architecture, uh, which was important to us as well. And then I think the third thing was this Windows 95 transition that was happening about then, which meant a lot of consumers were buying PCs. And these PCs had ready-made sockets for our stuff. And a, you know, and a pinup demand for cool games. So I think the, the timing was very good on when we came to market. And Windows 95 was the first version of Windows that could actually conceivably run a game without choking, correct? Well, people would still argue about that, I think, but uh, there were successful Windows 95 games. But DOS was still very important at the time uh, that we were you know, first coming out. I think Windows 95 just really drove a lot of new PC sales that had PCI buses in it, and that was a, that was a big, um, we, I remember great debates when we were designing the first Voodoo about what buses we needed to support. Do we need to support ISA or VL bus or PCI? And um, those are always the hard things as a, when you're developing new technology is how far back you need to support because you can really get bogged down in supporting legacy. And um, supporting PCI only 
was, I think, a really important decision because it enabled lots of other things. It was it reduced our market initially because not every computer had a PCI bus, but pretty quickly that got taken care of, largely because of Windows 95 already new, new sales. It, it, it becomes one of those things that you remember now, which is in a startup, oftentimes what you don't do is every bit as important as what you do do. And leaving things off like this legacy support for ICER, VL bus, uh, you know, because I'm sure I was probably arguing that we should we should support it because we're going to lose this installed bus. And the engineers would be saying, "Yeah, but the future is this thing." And and now and now we know, right? Was that hard with your investors? Because it sounds like you made several decisions like that to leave legacy things behind. You left behind 2D. You left behind buses. Um, were your investors happy with your decisions? Were they were they involved enough to care? I think the investors. By the time we ch chose the, the initial investors and then added to that, I think uh, they were pretty convinced that we knew what we were doing. And I don't remember them ever being you know, overly involved in what we decided to do product-wise or market-wise. And by the time, you know, by the, time the, the products got launched, we were on a pretty healthy growth ramp. So, you know, and investors always like that. So. If you're, if you're delivering, they're, they're happy people, usually. And Gary, you had mentioned during the break some points on, about software you wanted to? Yeah, just that when we started, there were no real 3D games on the PC. And, and so it took a while to get going. Um, I was trying to remember some of the early game companies that we had been talking to, like Papyrus and um, id Software that had software renders. and. Um, you know, some of the transition was made uh, easy to easy to do to our software library, which was easy to use. But to get them to use it, they go, well, "What's your installed base?" Well, we don't have any cards out there, really. <laughs> Trust and, us. And, and then the you know, the the board vendors will go, well, "How many games run on your stuff?" Well, none yet. Take advantage of it. So it was a you know hockey stick growth getting going. But as soon as you get the first couple, you know, then it starts picking up. And, and so there was a transition period there where, where it was uh, very slow to start with. But we, we did something we were trying to recall what it was with the Doom engine at the time. We sort of ported it over to our hardware early on ourselves and got it running. One of our engineers was just a fanatic about the software, so he figured it out and how to get it running. And, and then we got Quake on our hardware very early, and that was a big selling point. Um, the other thing that we had going for us though is we did have arcade wins by then. And so the fact that Midway was going to use our technology uh, for arcade games gave us this air of legitimacy that, that meant that you know this, this must be good if Midway's going to use it. And then we had some Japanese you know, companies come on board as well. And so that really helped with the PC game developers. So did you have a formal relationship with id Software since they were one of the most popular uh, developers in that time frame? Well, it evolved. Early on, we were chasing John Carmack and id. Uh, it, was, it was clear that um, we needed a killer app to really drive the sales. And Doom, Doom came out while we were still developing the original Voodoo 1. And it was just a, it was a runaway hit. It, was, it wasn't really 3D per se. It was kind of 2.5D, as we like to say. Um, but uh, it was so popular amongst the consumers and, and really created this kind of first person genre shoot 'em up game. Um, and we really wanted to forge a relationship with John Carmack, who was the founder of it. Um, and there was a lot of hype behind this second game called Quake. And um, Quake, when it first came out, was pure software rendering, so it didn't take advantage of any of the hardware acceleration. And as Gary mentioned, one of our, well, Pretty much all of our engineers were gamers. They played Doom and Quake into all hours of the night, and, and that was a big part of our culture, was sort of this gaming culture. Um, um, but John Carmack was always very good about um, sort of releasing parts of the engine and some capabilities to allow the, in, in essence, the Quake community to extend the, the rendering platform. And so our, our engineer actually figured out a way to um, create a renderer for Quake so that at the very least we could actually show John Carmack what Quake would look like if it was indeed took advantage of the hardware. And that was a huge uh, step for us because once he saw it, 
then his mind just started cranking and, and he very quickly went from being kind of a pure software rendering purist to one saying, hey, I don't need to do all this anymore. I can take advantage of the hardware. And that was once, once Carmack did the version of Quake, which supported uh, Voodoo 2, that was, that was our it. sales just yeah. went crazy. Because he converted it to OpenGL. You know, he had a, a major financial success with Doom uh, early on, so I think he took a financial risk, but very forward thinking, and said, I'm just going to write to OpenGL, and this is my minimum level. There's at least one piece of hardware out there that does this. Everyone else is going to come along sooner or later, right? And for him, he didn't care if it came, took a year or two, you know. I think uh, he, could, he could afford it and whatnot. So he sort of, I think, set, set the bar for what hardware should do. And that helped us tremendously, because it, it looked gorgeous on our, on our hardware. And uh, it was sort of a perfect fit for our hardware. So that was one of the major applications on uh, the platform. It was Tomb Raider, the other major one? It was a very popular game too, and it was beautiful. And so, um, and it was kind of, it was more, in some ways, family friendly, I guess. Uh, <laughs> That's um, a very relative thing to say about yeah, Tomb Raider. Um, but there were there were a number of games that, and people had their favorites. Um, in the hardcore gaming community, Quake was the thing. When yeah. Quake came out, it was uh, it drove everything, and it, it drove. There, and there were, and then Unreal came out after that, I believe. Right, and once there's one or two of them, then the other guys are looking and go like, you know, the, the, the lead game developers don't want to come out with something that now looks worse than all their competitors, right? So it's sort of, they, they start pushing themselves, I think, to look better. And uh, so it very quickly went from, you know, no hardware support to quite a, quite a lot. And nowadays, it's like, They're all every, everyone assumes that, Every, there's hardware out there, it's all going to run in hardware. You know, this happened probably five or ten years ago. But it, it took a little while, a couple of years, for it to catch on. Um, but then when it did, you know, they saw the results, you see the results, so it was worth it. So is this box on the table then the first uh, Voodoo card you released? I think it might have been. I think it was. Um, it doesn't seem to have the Voodoo branding on it. Is no, it doesn't. This was, um, but it, this was Orchid, right? That's just priority. Priority, right? Yeah, that was the, this was an original, this was a Voodoo One. Orchid was the name of the board company. Um, we had our little logo on the back. But uh, this is before we really developed, oh, I guess it's on the front too, before we developed the 3DFX brand. So we were just some largely unknown chip company at that point. And, um, as, as things evolved with the, especially with Voodoo 2, and we got more of the mainstream board manufacturers, um, for example, Creative Labs and Diamond Multimedia, they, they were truly the, the major players in the graphics board space at that point. Um, that's when we got, our brand was, was much more pronounced and, and uh, a bigger part of, of their offerings. So how long was the, uh, between the Voodoo 1 and 2? About a good uh, year. Yeah, about a year. We did it pretty quickly thereafter. Um, changed silicon process, so we got a, a big speed up. I think the first first Voodoo one ran at 40, 50. 45 or fifty megahertz, mm -hmm. and the Voodoo two ran at ninety plus. Um, Same with the memories as well, right? The memories all speeded up, and then we um, moved a, half of the stuff that was done on the CPU. We did move into hardware. Um, so that got another big speed up. Yeah. Big that, geometry speed up. Yeah. That we demoed at Comdex. What was that? Maybe late 97? Is that a million triangles per second? Uh, that, was a, that was a GDC. That um, was a Voodoo 1, I think. We first showed Voodoo 2 at Comdex. And I remember Creative Labs, one of the exclusive, remember that? Oh, yeah. To show it. And Creative Labs at the time was just a just monster, a huge, huge um, company and, and very, very widely followed, and they were kind of the marquee upgrade uh, company at the time. And they had this massive, uh, Comdex at the time was a big deal. I mean, I don't know how many people would go to Comdex. All of 100,000 people yeah. or something, it's crazy. Um, and almost the entire Creative Labs booth was about Voodoo 2. And um, we had this demo showing Quake running on a Voodoo 2, 
and we would have people stacked 20, 30 people deep looking at these videos, you know, just or just goggling over, you know, how you could actually do this. It was it was very very cool to see. Now I understand some of your demos and trade shows um, actually were using. I think you mentioned this before, using the SGI hardware to emulate yours. Um, were you away from this at that point and using your own? Or? Yeah, that oh, was yeah, all yeah, pre Voodoo before one we had stuff. Hardware. 90, I must have been 95, 95. right? Yeah, we had um, the chip was a, probably a little little behind schedule. And we had a, a Comdex event. Whose booth were we in? We were in Orchid's booth. Yeah. I think it was Orchid's right. booth. Yeah. And Orchid was next door to Diamond. And, uh, and it turns out several of our colleagues from Pellucid were at Diamond at the time, and, and we didn't have silicon. So what are we gonna do? So we said, well, you know, let's put an RE, and it'll be the Voodoo Graphics you know, simulator. And we, 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 had it, we, we, were, we were very clear that it was a simulator, and we, we showed um, an NV1, I think it was an NV1 at the time, running like a Sega Virtua Fighter game, which looked awful. The NVIDIA card at yeah. the time? And then we had Valley of Raw, which was our yes, yeah. environment mapped, um, you know, and you can find videos of this on the internet, but our environment mapped um, game demo running on the Reality Engine. And um, the results were remarkable. People said, well, why would, why would you buy that when you could get this thing? And, and all the NVIDIA guys, we're just screaming about, well, it's not the real thing. It's, it, well, yeah, but it, it's a simulator, it's fine. And it turns out when we brought out the real chip, we ran the thing side by side, and as Gary said, you could not tell the difference. In fact, in some ways, the, the real hardware actually outperformed the emulation mode that we had implemented on the RE. So, I mean, it was, it was very accurate, and admittedly what we did was probably a little close to the edge in terms of... <laughs> Gordy approved it. He thought it was a great idea. <laughs> but the good thing is we delivered what we promised, and that was the most rewarding part of it, right? So your company culture sounds a tad bit irreverent. You've named the chips the T-Rex, the FBI. Um, there's a video floating around with an Elvis painting in your headquarters, as well as, I think, a Gorm or Gorm from Star Trek. Uh, what was company culture like? It was fun. It was... Um work hard, play hard, you know, take him to the logical extreme. And because we were focused on games, it was like, um, I mean, you know, in our first building, we quickly ran out of space, and so we had like a dungeon that we put the software engineers into and the game developers. Uh, was that like a basement? What was that? Yeah, it was a, like a shipping, a receiving warehouse. warehouse. And, and, and with no and I never turned the lights on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just like, it was perfect for them because they didn't like light. <laughs> 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 so, uh, Is this important. the building that had birds nesting? Yeah. 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 yeah, we had a swallow's nest, a barn That's swallows. So it would come every year. Back um, of the Sunnyvale Golf Course. Right? Right? The, uh, the eighth hole or something. The eighth hole. We'd sit out there and drink beer and, you know, incoming golf balls. You'd have to dodge a bit. But it was. The culture was was great. I mean, it, I um, they're very young. Uh, most of the software engineers are early twenties, gamers through and through. Loved games. Um, would code during the day and play games at night. I mean, we would have these company wide doom fests, you know. And at the time, that was that was very new. That you could you know hook up. Land party. Multiple PCs through the through the Ethernet and actually play against each other in these first person combat games. And so we'd have all company Doom Fest. Um, so it, it definitely created a culture of of fun and you know, it was all about the games. Was that a selling point in competing against the networking companies for talent and Oh, I think it was a great selling point. Anytime you're you're doing something that is visual that you can actually see and, and you know, look and see what you're going to be working on. In fact, I remember one of our first salespeople, we actually had um, one of these mini mock-ups that we did. We took an arcade box and, and um, inside it put a PC running uh, this video loop of Gary's simulator. And uh, this was actually in our, in our lobby of, uh, of, that, of that first office we had in Sunnyvale. And uh, one of our first salespeople um, you know, we interviewed her and ended up hiring her. And um, uh, she actually didn't realize 
until she was there at that. Oops. We had no product at that point. It wasn't so. real. <laughs> she would say. Yes, it wasn't real. So, uh, um, but it, I think it was a huge selling point, the fact that we were, you know, consumer focused and gaming focused and fun focused. And we had a very unique blend of doing really innovative technology and doing silicon engineering and a lot of software and mapping that into you know, really thinking we were a game company, uh, thinking we were an entertainment company. So, you know, we did a lot more marketing than probably any chip company had ever done. You know, ultimately, after this was, you know, after we'd gone public and other things, you know, we did television advertisements and we did all these things. And for a chip company in Silicon Valley, that was almost unheard of at the time. And everybody really got into the swing of it. I mean, you'd, you'd go down into the, the area that was never lit up and you know every every time you would go down there, they, they'd show you something new. I mean, a new demo and a new mapping technique. You know, there's always something, and it was kind of fun. I mean, it was a very creative environment. People loved to try and figure out something new that we could do. What was it like to be in charge of a company with 3D FX's culture? Well, you know, the, I, I think the 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 work hard. Uh, and you know the play hard thing was, you know that 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 to me was kind of Silicon Valley, you know, and you, you know, you went out and and socialized with you know with your crew and had beer fests and did all that kind of stuff, um, and you know a friendly environment where everybody you know knew everybody and everybody you know kind of was not in a, in a hierarchy so much as you know part of the group team was kind of I think the way you did that but the you know I think the the thing that was added here was I think the it's the gaming industry and that that was a whole new twist on it and I think it, I mean if you go to the trade shows is a good example you'd have guys that you know would show up in our booth with Dracula capes and 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 pointed teeth <laughs> I mean it was just crazy so when did you guys realize that you weren't quite in the computer hardware business per se anymore? Well, I, I think we actually were because I mean, if if these guys hadn't you know absolutely been on the cutting edge, then none of this would have been successful. I mean, the the trick to this was while we went out and we were pretty creative, I think, on the customer side and and you know putting a huge developer program in place and things like that. I mean, if you didn't have a cutting edge technology product to work with, you wouldn't have been this successful. So I, I think we were, we were a cutting edge uh, you know, computer company in this sense. Uh, just going back to trade shows for a minute, the, the one that I remember uh, that I was I think most proud of, I think, was a SIGGRAPH in New Orleans. If you remember that, right? Where we showed the Grand Blue demo. Oh, yeah. Right? Because this is not a PC, traditional PC show like Comdex. It's but rather a workstation. The thing. Right? And uh, so we brought our best and baddest hardware at the time. Is that, I was think. that Voodoo 2? I think it was Voodoo 2, where it's showing multiple texture maps at the same time because we had designed the chips to be expand, uh, expandable, where you could do two or three of the texture mapping chips and actually do two or three textures simultaneously. Um, and one of these boards here is, is sort of built like that. And uh, so that SIGGRAPH, I don't know if it was 96 or 97 that summer, but we showed technology that, you know, was, you know, rivaling SGI's, you know. Uh, high end. High end, you know, not quite, but I mean, it, it was pretty amazing though for a little PC. So the board that's on the right of the table then, the four boards linked together, um, was that something you introduced in Voodoo 2, the ability to link boards together? Well, actually, and this is an interesting side note as well, Voodoo 1 had scalability built into it. It had the, the ability, Gary had talked earlier about scanline, you know, that we reduced everything to scan lines, and um, we had included the capability to do scanline interleaving, so you could actually effectively double the performance. Now, the marketeer at the time said, we don't need that. You know, let's just focus on schedule and get the thing out you know, and forget that feature. And of course, the engineers 
as they often do, didn't listen and put it in there. And so even Voodoo One had scalability and it turned out to be probably one of our most important features ever. So it shows how much marketing really knows at times. But, um, but then we extended that to, to different levels. And so this beast over here was actually a board done um, in a spinoff of 3DFX called Quantum 3D that build boards for visual simulation. Actually, the old SGI market, we kind of went full circle and went after that. And so here we took the scalability of the, the Voodoo architecture to its logical extreme. So there are four SLI boards, all SLI'd again together to do really high performance levels. And so this, these, th that product would actually truly compete with a high-end SGI machine. In fact, in the VizSim market, it chased them out of that. So it could do full scene anti-aliasing and all kinds of features. And it just took advantage of the scalability and the horsepower of the underlying graphics architecture. So part of the thought process that led to all this stuff was that as we started to you know, speculate on what was really happening behind 3D effects and its market phenomena, is we, we speculated that the PC would really drive 3D graphics. And that companies like SGI would not be able to sustain the, the pace of development dollars necessary to, you know, to stay in front. And as it turns out, I think that was correct. Now, we did a spin-out company called Quantum 3D to actually go after that particular market more directly. And I think while we were right about the speculation that the PC would drive 3D graphics, I think we underestimated the complexities of getting into the high end of the market. Um, so. But it, it was pretty interesting. I think the, the PC volume was definitely uh, what drove 3D graphics. Um, Ross, perhaps you might want to talk about this. Uh, if you're just reading the transcript, there's a box on the left of the table. It says Righteous 3D Orchid. It's the original uh, Voodoo box. And there's a 3D FX logo somewhere on it, but from 10 feet away, I can't see it. Um, the box on the right is a Voodoo 5 box. Um, where it's 3D FX branding all over it, and I can't tell you who the OEM that made it is. How did you, how did you go from you guys being an afterthought on the box to the OEM being an afterthought on the box? I think actually by the time this board came out, we were actually in the board business. So there was a, when we started the company, we sold chips and, and development kits to, to board makers who would make their own boards. And that's where Orchid and Diamond and Creative Labs and all the other board guys. And we had every board maker, Canopus and all kinds of board makers making boards uh, using our chips. And we did a good job of enforcing our branding. So it was very small there, but over time it grew substantially. As Scott mentioned that, you know, at Comdex we dominated the, um, the Creative Labs booth in, in one year. Um, probably, was it 98 that we bought STB or when was that? Somewhere around. Yeah. We, uh, we actually, and I had actually left the company by then. I was off focusing on this craziness uh, at that point in time. Um, but we acquired a, a, a board company and went after the board business, you know, really in full pursuit. And so this, this box here is just all 3D effects. It was a 3D effects branded product. Okay. Was there a plan even before you bought the board company to get your branding out there above that of the OEMs? I'm not sure above, but certainly equivalent because we were the underlying architecture. And, and what we had is our, you know, kind of our North Star was Intel inside. You know, they, they had a very successful branding program where, you know, uh, and of course they had spent hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. We couldn't afford that, but we, we knew we could drive branding, you know, substantially, you know, with our, with the power of the consumer that loved 3D effects branding. So, um, you know, shortly after this product came out, the Righteous 3D product, you know, we had a lot of other products came out that had much more prominent branding. And Glide, I, if I remember correctly, was a very big part of the branding you did as well, trying to get things out that said they were written for Glide, or? I, I don't remember that. Um, well, I think in we tried early to, days. Yeah, we tried to brand, that. I don't think we tried to brand Glide per se as much as we branded sort of powered by 3D effects logo on the games themselves. So uh, if you flip through the gaming magazines at the time, you'd see some hot new game coming out and you know down in the corner would be a, a logo saying powered by 3D effects. So it was uh, very similar to the Intel inside kind of idea. And, uh, but it fed upon itself. I mean, the game, 
the game developers and publishers actually liked it because there was uh, pretty quickly it was it was obvious that the hardcore gamers all had 3 effects boards and that's the same audience that the publishers were selling to so the publishers wanted the lo that logo they wanted the support that they wanted to market the fact that the game supported 3 effects it was a selling point for them and it obviously allowed us to raise our our uh, brand as well um, and that did, as Ross mentioned, culminated in, in our moving the business model away from just chips to selling the entire board. The thinking there was that we could really control the brand. So instead of sharing it with a diamond or a creative labs, that we could control everything. And that was, that was where we eventually uh, evolved to. When did you guys IPO? 1998. And what was your, pro your main product on the market at that time? Was it still the Voodoo 2 or were you? It was, uh, the Voodoo 2 was just ramping, and um, there was another product that we um, told the, the public markets about, uh, which was ultimately branded the Voodoo 3. It was internally called Banshee, and that was our first product that incorporated uh, VGA and 2D graphics and 3D all into a single chip. And so the public markets were very interested in that product because that was the continued evolution of 3D effects getting us into more mainstream, in particular being able to sell to computer manufacturers um, as an OEM chip. So that was obviously where a lot of volume was. And, and you know, there, we continued to, to really be focused on the upgrade markets and selling boards through the retail channels for people to upgrade their PCs. But there's a whole other space where NVIDIA and S3 and others were playing where you would sell chips directly to the OEMs, the Dells and the Gateways and the Compacts at the time. And uh, Banshee was all about that market, so it was a brand new market opportunity for us. Okay. How big were you guys by the time you um, IPO'd? Well, I remember uh, our revenue went from four to 40 to 200, and somewhere between the 40 and the 200, I think, is when we went public. What was that? Did you have a particular reason for going public, just to get liquidity? For your shares, or because everyone does it when the company reaches a certain size. Uh -huh. No, I think what yeah. what you do is you try and, and do the IPO so you have you know some cash resources, and that's what we did. I mean, we went public so that we had resources in the company, because you know you can't always count on everything being up to the right all the time, and you know it's like if you look at Apple today. I mean, Apple has more cash resources than. Almost anybody, <laughs> but they're also a very you know secure company because of that. They can weather an awful lot of problems, and you know every uh, succeeding generation gets more expensive and takes longer to do. Uh, and you know if you slip in in the development cycle on the next generation, or God forbid if it comes out and doesn't work, you know then you'd have some safety uh, in your cash reserves to be able to weather that storm. Okay. So by the time you guys IPO'd around that time, you left Ross, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you did not continue as CEO after the IPO. You were yeah, no, we we hired a new guy to come in and be CEO. Um, what was the reason behind that? Were you just tired of it at that point? You no, know, I was primarily a, a venture capitalist at the time, and I actually had you know a fund that you know we were investing out of, so. You know, this was something that you know I came over to do, uh, not not as a full time job, but came over to do, uh, in addition to the job I was actually doing. Uh, and in retrospect, I think you know probably would have been better if I'd stayed. But <laughs> um, anyway, you know it 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 was never really intended to be a you know a long term deal for me. So. I'm sorry, I didn't. What was the year again of the IPO? 98. 98. So not particularly long after that, by about, I believe, near the end of 2000, 3 dfx wound up filing for bankruptcy and had all of the assets substantially bought by NVIDIA. If I'm correct on Reverse that. order, but doesn't really matter. We sold it first, and then we basically sold all the assets of the company and what remained was was uh, what ultimately filed for bankruptcy. And Nvidia had did not have an interest in being in the retail board market. You know, like we talked about selling through the retail channels, 
what NVIDIA really wanted was the technology, the chip capability, the engineers, et cetera. So um, we constructed a transaction, so you sort of sold all the good assets that they wanted and, and left some of the, uh, the pieces of the business that they didn't want. So it was the latter part that ultimately fang fell to bankruptcy. So what happened over those intervening two years that took you guys from the top of the market um, into basically being sold to your competitor? Well, I think um, probably the biggest decision that we made that ultimately became um, probably the anchor of the company was this decision to get into the board business. And that was, you know, we talked about this at length in the management team and the board and you know, you hear about some of these acquisitions and decisions being make or break for the company, and you know, we talked very specifically about it being a make or break decision. And ultimately, I think um, we assumed too much. Um, we started competing with what used to be our customers, so the creative labs and the diamonds of the world who used to be our customers, once we got into the board business, they were now our competitors. And so, you know, on the one hand, we were competing against the chip guys like NVIDIA and S3 and others, then we were then, once we got in the board business, we were competing with all the board guys. And so it really was a, we're gonna do it all kind of strategy. And, um, you know, that's a big bet. And when, you know, just a little bit of slip as we did, we were a little bit late coming out with some of the next generation products and didn't have the runway to, you know, to, to kind of come up with the next generation products, which I think would have been very compelling in the market, but ultimately ran out of time. Had NVIDIA switched to a more traditional solution in the graphics space by that time? They had. Yeah, they took a very different approach where um, after the, they realized the mistakes with the original uh, chips, um, the third generation, um, NV3 as it was called, was um, very specifically designed for the OEM space. So instead of worrying about kind of the high-end upgrade market and the gaming market, et cetera, that we were focusing on, they designed a chip to really go directly after the S3s of the world, you know, OEM-centric business model. And what happened is those models ultimately converged. So they uh, drove a lot of success and, and, and were able to grow their company very effectively with an OEM chip model. And we ultimately kind of converged directly competing against them. We came from the high-end 3D space and ultimately got into the OEM, and that was where we collided. This was also uh, sort of beginning, middle of the first internet boom at the time. Did that have any impact on what you guys were doing? Well, I think the environment certainly did. I mean, it was crazy in Silicon Valley. Um, and so there was, uh, it was a difficult time to, um, to try to grow a company from the recruiting perspective and a lot of distraction because there was a lot of other things that were going on in the market outside of what we were doing, you know, networking companies and the internet wave. Um, we tried to do things through uh, our uh, ISV partners, the, the game developers and others, to try to do 3D acceleration for web browsing and stuff like that, but that was way too early for its time. So um, I, I'd say there there was um, really more on the business side. We had to compete against kind of everything that was going on on the, on the internet wave. We didn't really take advantage of that very much. Cool. One of the things I've seen uh, in a few people's history of NVIDIA, uh, excuse me, of 3DFX, uh, claiming that was one of the company's downfalls was um, excessive employee perks, which frankly, sitting like 100 yards away from Google is almost a laughable idea at the time that you guys were spending 50,000, uh, the number I hear is $50,000 a month on lunch. Do you think that was in any way an impact on you guys, or was that, is that just sort of a red herring people are throwing out and not looking at the real structural issues? Well, I don't remember our perks were particularly extreme. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't think there was anything really in, in that. I think it was just a really bad decision to get in the board business. And that was, um, that's something that I was on the board at the time and I argued very strongly against that. But um, ultimately the board chose to actually go ahead and do that. And I, I think, you know, it was, you, you, can't, you can't take a high flying, high multiple, high technology, uh, sexy 3D graphics chip company and marry it with a 
marginal piece of crap board company <laughs> come out of it with anything that's good. So. Well, this would, this would almost be like them buying their own foundry in a way, wouldn't it? No, the foundry would have been okay. Uh, the problem was that you know you, you were in the business of selling chips to all these guys that put them on boards. And as soon as they figured out that you were in the board business, they didn't want to buy from you. And so where did you, you know, you know, you either made the transition very, very quickly and became a dominant guy in the board market, but if you didn't do that, you died. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I guess then it sounds like the group at the table was pretty much against this decision, but it happened. Anyway, did you guys continue to stick around for a while after that? Ross was already gone. You had gone back to the venture capital side. Yeah, but I was, I was, I was on the board throughout this whole saga. Hey, okay. Derek Gare and I were there to the bitter end. And so, Gary, yeah. you're at NVIDIA now, actually. Correct. Currently. Yeah. Um, did you go to NVIDIA as well, Scott? Or? I did not, no. I had, uh, uh, it, I, I just felt I wanted to do something outside of 3D graphics. It had been a fun ride and I wanted to try something different. Yeah, uh, so my, myself and I think about almost 100 engineers went, were hired by NVIDIA in the subsequent month. And there was another group of about 20 that weren't that went off to various startups. But the interesting thing is most of those ended up failing in the next year. <laughs> so we got to say hi to some old friends again about a year later. <laughs> some uh, very good friends that came back after a year or two in the market. So to what extent then, um, with NVIDIA absorbing so many 3DFX engineers, uh, did the uh, following NVIDIA products sort of become the 3DFX products that were never um, released? We tried to think of some ways to marry the technology, but that really wasn't, um, it wasn't necessary, and it, it wasn't really probably, it wouldn't have been a good idea anyway, because you can't like, like try to bolt two things together. I mean, it was just A versus B and both were good, so. But the one thing that they did do was, um, and now market, is all this, uh, they got the trademarks, all our trademarks, and for SLI, so that's still one of their big marketing things. They were the first, one of the first companies after 3DFX to come out with something called SLI. It wasn't and, the same SLI, but right. they used the, they used they, the right, brand. Right, right, it was done a little differently. Same concept, I think technically done very differently, but, People still remember the trademark SLI from these days. It's right on right. that board there. It was this originally box. like what, uh, like scanline interleaving. Interleaving, it became like yes. scannable yep. link interface or yeah, scanline like interleaving is what it was. And so they use that in their marketing and such. And um, and uh, yeah, so it's still that that term still lives on today, and it's a big part of things. They sell PCI cards with two chips on them, I believe now. Yeah. They still have been doing that for a number of years, so. I actually owned a pair of NVIDIA cards in SLI. Yeah. They were both fast and loud. Yes. Very, very Yes, loud. well, we're getting them quieter so some now. Some things don't change. <laughs> yes. We're now working on quiet and, and, and low power, so. So we've sort of gone through the history from beginning to end and have skipped over probably quite a lot in, the, in doing so. So what haven't we talked about that we ought to? People, funny anecdotes, yeah. competitors, random name dropping of other intersections with computer companies through the, through the time you were there. Well, the, just as a side note, I mean, these guys were peripherally involved, but the whole quantum 3D experience was quite interesting because we took this PC graphic stuff into this professional market and we clobbered some of these proprietary guys in the flight simulation market with 3D effects technology. And we, we changed that industry as well. I, some would say that we ruined it because we brought the PC in that marketplace. But, um, I mean, SGI, which, which had a multi-hundred million dollar a year business selling image generators to the flight sim community, we put them out of that business with, with Voodoo Graphics, basically. How did you continue to develop it afterwards? Did you just continue down the... Well, one thing is that we had... So the, the, the final chip that we used was called the VSA 100. That was Voodoo... Was that Voodoo 5? It's part of this, yeah. Yeah. And we had built um, this massive thing called Alchemy, um, which is another four-chip monster like this thing. And 
We won every, there's one over there actually. Uh, we, we won every major flight sim, driving sim, sim whatever. And so like the Boeing F-15 is, uses our stuff and the F-16 and F-18 and, and all these aircraft and ships and everything used, they, they made the transition to PC-based image generation based on that technology. And it'll never go back. I mean, it, it's all PC-based now. And so that was very interesting because a feature that we had put in, and admittedly that I was initially against, but now fully embraced, was this SLI stuff. And it turned out to be, the mo it, it enabled Quantum 3D to actually be successful. And so that was a really interesting aspect. And you know, we rode that way for a long time. Um, it, how, how long were you with Quantum 3D? Well, in dog years, it would be 70. Um, I was there 10 years or 11 years, long time. Yeah, people don't realize, but the, you know, the PC graphics migrated in a lot of different places, and the cockpit was one of them. And it was interesting because as the cockpits went from 2D to 3D, and then the GPS worldwide database came out, now all of a sudden, you know, you could have an entire worldwide database of all the uh, geography so that you didn't fly into mountains and you didn't do a lot of things. And, you know, that's all PC graphics again. And it's been absolutely astounding how some of those things happen. We sold millions of dollars of GPUs to all the avionics companies, Honeywell, Garmin, um, Bendix. Um, and, and at the time, you know, we became kind of the dominant GPU supplier into the cockpits of most of the military aircraft and now commercial aircraft as well. So were you still using late 90s GPUs into the 2000s or were you... Did you switch over to like we NVIDIA? We switched to NVIDIA after NVIDIA acquired um, 3DFX. So in like 2001, we did our first um, embedded system based on the NV17 chip, which was a great chip. We sold a gazillion of those. And, uh, and then we also switched the image generator business over to NVIDIA um, with a product we called Independence, which, which did the same kind of trick of synchronizing multiple in, you know, NVIDIA chips before they even had that, before, before they had SLI, we were able to do that using FPGAs in our own software. So that became very popular as well. Did any of your products ever get used in um, early applications of what would now be scientific or general purpose GPU computing? Was that even thought of then, or were you guys just gaming graphics? But all in the gaming, we didn't really have the ability to program the chips per se that you would need to have that kind of flexibility in terms of, of you know, the GPU-like <coughs> capability today. Um, the product that we were working on at the very end before we sold to NVIDIA, um, we did have a separate geometry chip that we were working on that perhaps could have done some of those types of things. That would yeah. have been a very high-end geometry chip, but um, uh, that hadn't actually been yeah. didn't released a fab, I don't think, by the time. No, and it was um, it probably wasn't like 32-bit. Was it 32-bit right. IEEE? Maybe not, yeah. The technology, it's similar to you know 10 years before that. The technology was just getting to the point where you could do floating point in these chips um, at reasonable speed and accuracy to start then addressing these other markets which had, you know, real requirements um, for like medical simulation, and seismic simulation, and all those kind of applications. But now it's like a lot of the, a lot of the top supercomputers are built out of GPUs now. So that, that, in the last 10 years, it's made that transition. But that was from 2000 to 2000, you know, 13. Um, from, you know, you know, I guess the first five years of that, it was just, you know, the technology was just becoming feasible, I would say. Um, and going back to movies again briefly, in the late 90s, uh, Pixar became well known. Um, Lucasfilm, they did the first of the new Star Wars movies with like the most CGI anyone had ever seen in movies up to that time. Was there any overlap at all between that stuff and you guys, or were, was it still pretty much entirely separate? Actually, to Tom so, Ford, yeah, <laughs> we used to talk to them, but it was still pretty much separate because they would do things offline yeah, for the final offered. rendering. We had always dreamed that one of these days we'd have 3D graphics good enough to have a real, you know, time movie capability where you could actually exist in, in this 3D environment. And 
it was kind of interesting. I remember one of the financial conferences that I went to. And this is after Jobs got bounced out of out of Apple, and you know he was focused on uh, Pixar and I think a little bit of, of of Next at the time. And I saw him at a table putting out uh, you know brochures and stuff like that. So I went over and and chatted with him a little while, and I said, you know, you've got Pixar doing some fun stuff, and we've got this great 3D graphics engine. You know, why don't we get together and do some neat stuff? And you know, Steve always was, you know, the kind of guy that was on the cutting edge, doing this, doing that. And it's the the one time I can ever remember talking to him that, in, in his response, astounded me. He says, "Well, you know," he says, "That'd be fun, but right now I'm just working on, you know, basically our, our results and trying to make sure that, you know, that we have performance and, you know, and and." And good numbers, and and I couldn't believe that this was Steve Jobs saying this because you know it was about 180 degrees from what you'd expect, but you no, know, we never really seemed to be able to get any traction on that side. But in general, though, if you look at a frame of animation for a movie, uh, those things still today render in hours. You know, we had 17 milliseconds to render a frame, and so what you do in 17 milliseconds is you do the best you can to get the visual you know, complexity that, that you're trying for, but when you know, that, that clock signal hits, you gotta go. And so that's very different between real time and the non-real time market, which you know, the movie market is still non-real time. And, and, and the requirements, the technology that they're using to render these films are, are somewhat different and in a different league than the stuff we do for the real time, although now they may be converging somewhat because of programmability. But they would use techniques um, in sampling and stuff that we just couldn't do in hardware easy, easy enough. And it didn't really matter to them because they, they had enough compute power. They would burn 30 minutes per frame rendering it. What did matter to them was the workstations and the CAD stations that they used to design it, right? Because they'd sit there and wireframe and do it. And then they would send it off to get rendered. And a couple hours later, they could see if it was good. Now the difference is they can view it in really high quality, not what they're going to show in the theater, but good enough to get a really good idea of what it's going to look like on the current you know, PCs and graphics, and, and then send it off for final rendering. So what they can preview is you know, good. much, much closer to their final product. Because if you've seen the animations like in the shows now, it's like, is that from a movie? You know, is that real time or is that whatever? It, it sort of doesn't matter. They can view it good enough now that they can get an idea. So. It's, it's vastly helped them, but it's still in the design on their work, you know, on their table, not the final product you see. Um, at 3DFX, at any point, did you guys do a division group, whatever, that was just sort of focused on research? We had an advisory council with some game members on it, some game developers on it. Um, but I wouldn't say we really had a research group. A few of us would go off and think about the next product, but we'd only been through about two product cycles, so we weren't, we weren't quite there yet where we had enough uh, resources and time to do a research group. And I understand you had a video game museum in, I guess, at least one of your buildings? You guys yeah, remember we did. that? Yeah. We had uh, old video we games. Had, you know, tried to collect as many as we could. I'm not sure what happened to that, though. It's kind of a tragedy. Yeah. A what prompted you to do that? We were in the game business, and so knowing the history of games was really important to us. And so I think Alma brought in like a Neo Geo or something. I can't remember when that started <laughs> a trend. A so we started, you know, we got a Sega Genesis, and we got a, you know, we had this whole, you know, display case full of these old, uh, old video games. Why did you feel the history was important? I ask this because some companies in the Valley, uh, most famously Apple, uh, claim not to care about history and almost that it's a, uh, you know, an anchor on them as they go out to create the future? Well, if we looked at our customers, the same people that bought that Neo Geo, maybe their children or whatever, those were our customers. And so understanding that what really drove our customers wasn't the technology, it wasn't, you know, the SLI, it's the game. And so having that connection to our customers about the fact that people bought our stuff primarily to play games, I think was a really important aspect of our success and that, that was that was reflected in everything that we did. From game developer recruitment, to our packaging, to our naming, to everything, it was all about 
being really customer focused. And so those old game systems and the arcade games represented, you know, an interesting aspect of what our customers were all about. Now, about your customers, people hear games and they tend to think kids. That wasn't your customer demographic, was it? Well, there were some kids. There were some interesting phone calls we got from 12-year-olds that at the, uh, <laughs> when they would come to the moment of purchase, they'd have to go get their mom to give us the credit card number and things like that. But um, there was a wide range of audience, but mostly it was kind of the older teenagers and 20-somethings that had the disposable income to buy a beefy PC, um, you know, and upgrade it, and then had the time and the wherewithal to play Quake all night. Because that was one of the revelations that we learned, was that a lot of these gamers were actually, you know, 20s and 30-year-olds, some of them 40-year-olds at the time, that had disposable income, and that were just avid gamers. They'd spend $5,000 a year on building custom PCs with boards. And they still do. And Today, there were, except there were now they're 16, 70 years old. Yeah, and, and well, there were companies like Falcon Northwest yeah. and Alienware that had sprung up building these, you know, kind of bespoke PCs for the game market that were tuned and ultimately became cryogenically cooled and, you know, crazy. And that's a good point we haven't talked about. We've been talking about uh, boards being sold retail. Um, how much did you get sold into computer, pre built computers? We had a pretty good amount of that. We had early on. We had a couple of companies that built game PCs. NEC had one. HP had one. I'm not sure how successful they really were in terms of their overall volumes. But as soon as they saw this trend for uh, for the you know game PCs, they kind of jumped on board. And there were the specialists who like you know Falcon Northwest, you know, who really you know had a passion for building these things. And they're they're still around. They still build good products today. Yeah, Voodoo 3 was the first product that was really designed for the computer manufacturers. Um, so that was the, the first time that we actually had real design wins with interesting volumes for the more mainstream computer guys. Yeah, the other part was kind of a boutique. Um, you know, it'd, be in, it'd be in one game skew that HP had or NEC had. So the really interesting thing is people are still building these boards or trying to. And we still get emails from people. Do you have any spare chips left over? <laughs> Do you have a printed circuit board design? Do you have any documentation on how to write software for them? Because they're still building boards. Physically building Voodoo Physically boards? Physically doing them and modifying. They unsoldered all the RAM chips and replaced them with 200 megahertz RAMs. <laughs> and and it's upping the speed. These are guys in France, a lot of them. Um, but I get emails from them about two or three times a year asking for documentation. They wanted to license the, the design from NVIDIA, which owns it at one point. So, it just out of curiosity, why are they doing that instead of emulating it? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, why is a silly question. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. But uh, th because they can, I mean, they keep, you can go on YouTube, you can see videos of, you know, um, old games running on, you know, Windows 7 on our on our boards, you know. So they've done Windows Seven's drivers and things, and just amazing things with them. I still haven't figured out why, yeah. But it's a hobby, I guess. It's a good hobby of theirs. Hey, I've, I've got a jacket that's got a 3DFX logo on it. And, uh, every time I wear it out, almost somebody will come up and say, "Hey, I had a Voodoo board." <laughs> yeah, it had a real passion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it had quite a following. Space. Um. Not my question. It's okay, I forgot my answer. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, going, uh, skipping ahead to what you guys have done since, um, Gordy, you've gone more back into the traditional venture capital role? Um, actually, I, I spent about 15 years uh, on the venture capital role, but now I'm back on the company side again. Okay. So. And Ross, you've done a variety of startups yes. since then. Uh, Scott, you've done one startup? Same one, 70 dog years, as Ross <laughs> wants to say, and still going. Yeah. And, and you've stayed with NVIDIA. I'm, yep, easing into retirement and enjoying so, the benefits of 3D on my cell phones and whatever. So would you guys like to talk about the spectrum of how it is that you were happy to stay with a large company um, you've done one startup and you've been sort of a serial entrepreneur. Serial in parallel, I think, in your case. <laughs> um, well, now, now, to be fair, I 
did had the eleven year stint at Quantum 3D as well. So only um, after the board of Quantum 3D elected um, to, to do a kind of a, a different direction as well. Maybe there's some of that in my in my uh, portfolio basically. But um, I left Quantum 3D and um, have worked in a number of projects, many of which have still been involved with Gordy, um, uh, a web uh, kind of a web TV uh, kind of company called it's now called Leonovus. Um, worked at a mic microprocessor company or two. Uh, actually got into uh, back into like something I did a long time ago, which was 3D microscopes. Worked at Bruker and managed a division there. And then now have a couple of startups, one doing interesting DSP technology, kind of the same concept as Quantum 3D, which is using the PC to distort what is otherwise a perfectly healthy proprietary market for uh, uh, communications and, and measurement devices. And also, I have an app company building apps for these things. So, why for me, do you still want to do startups? It, it sounded like it was um, a very impressive amount of work. What makes you want to still do it? It is a lot of work, but it's the most rewarding thing you can do. It's building a company from from ground up is a, is a unique puzzle. I mean, if we look at the three D effects experience, we had this huge technological challenge of building this advanced chip or chipset. You know, and, and, and being able to deliver it to the consuming public very inexpensively, and also building a business model around that. Then you overlay that with having to build a company at the same time. It's a great puzzle, and um, it doesn't always work out. You can't always solve it, but when you do, it's very rewarding. What's it like in Silicon Valley building a company now um, as opposed to building one in 93, 94? I'm more tired, I think. <laughs> Uh, than I was then. I, I look at pictures of myself and I have darker hair and a lot fewer pounds and a lot more energy. But it's. Um, well, you know, in what, terms of the Silicon Valley ecosystem, working with venture capitalists, acquiring talent, that sort of thing? The, the talent part, uh, both my companies are at points where we haven't engaged the venture community quite yet. We're getting pretty close on one. Um, and there, you know. Uh, one of the things that we learned from Gordy is that don't be so focused on trying to raise money the old-fashioned way. There's a lot of other possibilities uh, where you can raise money, including overseas as well, and sometimes that's easier to do. Um, but in, the talent thing is still hard. It's really hard with you know Apple and Google and Facebook all here. Getting decent engineering talent here is very difficult. Um, so in fact, in one of my in both my companies, my core development teams, they're not in Silicon Valley. One is in Los Angeles, one is in San Diego, and one is in Serbia. So you kind of have to do what you have to do to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, we have good marketing and finance here and a few engineers, but in general, it's really hard to, to go head to head against Google or NVIDIA or any of these guys you know, to recruit talent. Scott probably has a good perspective on that as well. Yeah, I think the, the difference now in terms of starting a company is that it's such a distributed world. It, it really did used to be that if you, if you wanted to build a company, you needed to be in Silicon Valley. And sometimes maybe you could do it in Austin or Boston or some of these, these other places, but uh, all the great ideas seem to consistently come out of Silicon Valley. And um, I don't think you can really say that that's the case anymore. You know, the world is so connected um, that you can start companies all over the place. Um, certainly the, the venture capitalists um, invest in companies far and wide, not just in Silicon Valley. Um, I think the, the VCs also expect companies to be a lot further along than they used to because the costs of starting a company have plummeted. Um, so what's expected for you in terms of proof point is a much more mature state than what used to be go and write a business plan and show some PowerPoint slides and that was kind of where most companies were when they got funded. While that may still happen from time to time, um, most of the time now you have to have some proof point. Your website already exists and you've got so many users or your software exists and, and you've got so many downloads or what have you. So I think that in and of itself um, has changed a lot because it puts a lot more of the burden on the entrepreneurs that they have to do a lot more of the heavy lifting before they raise dollar one. Um, and as Ross said, there's a, an awful lot of alternative funding that exists now, whether it's you know, people that have, um, you know, been successful and now are interested in angel funding and those types of things or alternative 
you know, call them VCs or private equity firms or what have you, but they're all over the place now. It's not just Silicon Valley. Do you see angel funding as um, in some ways sort of doing the same thing that VCs used to, being perhaps more hands-on and more early stage? Well, I mean, you see certainly a number of companies that raise several million dollars of angel funding, and that used to be a real pretty meaty round A from the VC world, so yeah, in certain cases. And are you having the same problem that Ross described in terms of uh, finding talent? Yeah, it's, it's um, I, I think any company in Silicon Valley would say the same thing of, of um, when you start companies here, it's very hard to recruit, it's very hard to retain good quality people. So you have to find that balance of you know deciding what you're gonna try to do in Silicon Valley and deciding what you're gonna do elsewhere. Um, I think it's pretty rare these days that you try to do it all in Silicon Valley. It's just not feasible anymore. I mean, I just assumed with my current startups that I couldn't. I just said there's no way. I, I don't have enough uh, money or attraction, you know, to get people out of you know these big companies. So we went in with the assumption that we're going to have you know outsourced development, and like I say, I found a good team of engineers in Serbia. So they, they, they say nine out of ten startups fail. So I, I had a very good ride with uh, Silicon Graphics for about ten years, and then 3DFX for. Um, you know, about six or seven years, eight years, you know, from pre-founding, let's say. And those are probably two of the most rewarding work experiences I've had. And so I feel very fortunate to, you know, be two for two on those two experiences and um, just don't have a great desire to, uh, you know, or need to want to do that again because I had two really good experiences. <laughs> so I'm, it's like folding when you, you know, quitting while you're ahead almost. So it, those, those were great and I have a lot of great memories and they were definitely the best times working wise um, that, you know, and many people don't even get to experience it once. So I just feel very fortunate to have been there sort of twice. And uh, yeah. And she that's now, sporty. He's now doing it again. Now, now view it from the outside, but that's, you know, it's a matter of personal, personal preference and, uh, so I'm happy I've done it twice. Do you have a new company you're doing as well? Um, actually, I'm involved in a couple, but you know, the, um, the, the problem with venture capital is that you, you, know, you make an investment in a company and you can suggest you know, what they should do and shouldn't do, but they don't need to listen to you because all you are is an investor. And you know the only threat you really have is maybe you won't invest next time or whatever. And you know, it, you know there are a lot of aspects about venture capital that aren't re very rewarding in that sense. Um, it's a lot more fun actually to be in a company where uh, if you you know identify what you want to do, you can go do it. You know, it's a, a direct action response you know satisfaction sort of thing. Uh, so I think actually doing something in the company is, is in a lot of ways more rewarding than doing it from a venture capital standpoint. Uh, it, I think it's a lot more fun uh, doing the type of things that you're doing on the company side usually because as Ross said, when we did 3DFX we had to take a, basically a, a new concept of technology and not only you know, build it, but actually go out and market it and develop you know, the customer base for it. And those kind of challenges are a lot more fun, I think, than you know, just trying to decide you know, which new company would I invest in. What was the most surprising thing you guys learned during your time at 3DFX? Well, one of them, I don't know if it was the most, that gamers were worldwide and older. We get emails uh, you know, from people in Malaysia and all over the world. It's like, who, you know, I had no idea that it was that many gamers out there. And, and that they were, you know, like we said before, in their 20s and 30s. Um, and I think today it's, you know, it's, it's, it's that gaming market has grown even more substantial to now I think it, it literally dwarfs the movie industry, oh, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it's huge. The movie industry has, you know, suffered due to other things, but gaming markets just probably subsumed the movie industry, the arcade market, and the gaming industry. And 
few other things as well. So. And now the, the performances there on the portable devices, you know, you've yeah. got pretty quality gaming experiences in the, in the mobile market as well. Um, <clears throat> things you would do differently besides buying the board company? Still wouldn't do CAD. <laughs> Um, this comes, it comes for free eventually when you get there, but it definitely is not something to, to make a goal. But, um, well, as a thought experiment, if you guys had never bought the board company, um, what would be your plan for continuing to compete? Well, I think the, um, it's, even looking back, it's still uh, unclear what the right thing to do was. We, we had such a very different strategy than NVIDIA did. And you know, NVIDIA ultimately was was the competitor, um, and you know, I don't think we really had the I don't know the DNA or the culture of a company to build an OEM chip company, which ultimately is what NVIDIA did, and obviously has proven that's a very successful model. Um, I think in terms of looking at things from a you know, could could three D effects had a, a you know grown bigger and had a more successful future, um, it would have had to have been finding a way to either penetrate other markets, which I think at the time that was pretty small potatoes. We were looking at some IP licensing stuff where we would license some technology to some more consumer companies, but that was that didn't really materialize until much later. And, um, uh, much later. Um, but to really figure out a way to get into the OEM space much more aggressively than, than we did, it's a lot easier said than done though, because you almost really do have to change the whole culture of the company. And we were all about high performance gaming. And you just can't say, oh, now we're gonna yeah. know, add this OEM chip project. Uh, it, it's just a very different mentality. You, know, you, you mentioned the licensing, I forgot about that, but one of the things that we, that we did almost successfully do is we had a license deal for Sega, for the Dreamcast. For design deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, um, that might have also changed the company because that, that fell apart through some, um, well, in, ultimately it ended up in, in litigation that we won against Sega. And was it NEC as well? Yeah, they were involved in that. Um, where basically the, the next generation Dreamcast was going to be based on 3D effects technology. And, uh, and they, they changed at the last moment uh, over to NEC and to PowerVR, Power as a matter VR, of fact, yeah. which now powers a lot of uh, smartphones. But, uh, but that, that would have given us an interesting position as well, because if you look at both ATI and at um, NVIDIA, they've had significant revenues and profits that have come from you know, being part of a console. Um, so that, you know, had that you know, stuck, that might have been a very interesting aspect to do oh, that. It might have changed Sega's fortunes too. Oh yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, they, that decision to go with the, the different Graphics technology, I think, certainly Killed was a poor decision yeah. on that part too. So yeah, that could have could have changed it. Was that their last console? Yep. Yeah. 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 So. I guess the one thing I, to answer that question, which is, what would you do differently? I guess I would transition to being a more schedule-focused company earlier. I mean, early it didn't suit us because you just got to get done what you got to get done. But eventually, as you make that transition to what Scott said, like the OEM company, right? You know, you have to meet their schedules, not your schedules. And, um, and be more Windows friendly and compatible, um, which I think we sort of were just, a, towards the end we'd solved that problem, I think, but it was a schedule wise. And um, you know, at, at NVIDIA, that was sort of their mindset um, all along. And uh, it, it's interesting, because engineers never like to leave something out of a product. But what I learned was, you just have to change the way you think. You're not leaving it out, it's going into the next one. Right, this this guy's gone. Treadmill. It's not yeah, a, yeah it's yeah. it's not a problem. It's just like keep working on it. Just oh, you got a month now, and you don't have to work on it for a month, but then pick it up again because it goes into the next product. So for an engineer, for myself, it was very easy to um, rationalize the decision not to put it in this product, just to meet schedule. Because at the end, you could just cut all these things out, and you could just rationalize it as an engineer. It's just going into the next chip. We're not dropping it forever. We just get this one's gone. Next one. It's like you missed the bus, take the next bus, right? So I think we should have done motherboards personally. <laughs> but anyway, that's my. <laughs> <laughs>
Would you like to each offer a piece of advice <clears throat> to your choice of future engineers, marketers, biz developers, entrepreneurs, company builders? It's a great time. <laughs> sure. It's a fun time. Well, it's never, it never stops. It's always a great time. You know, the, the markets move so quickly, um, and I think there's always an opportunity for great entrepreneurs and technologists to, to set their mark. Uh, it's an awful lot of work, there's no doubt about it. I think, you know, Gordy's seen it more than any of us probably combined, but uh, sometimes you look back and you said, if I ever knew how much work it was going to be, would I ever do it? Usually the answer is yes, but you can never <laughs> overestimate the amount of work it takes to really start a company and take it somewhere. Since you guys are generally having the hardest time finding uh, engineers, programmers, that sort of thing, uh, what would you recommend younger people interested in technology, uh, what to major in, should they go to college, uh, et cetera? Well, there's an awful lot of computer scientists out there. That's not the problem. The problem is sort of where you, where you are and who you're competing against. Um, you know, I, I think what we've done is the, the most interesting balance, which is you know, be trained from a, a technical perspective and then bring a business side to it, because that's really what Silicon Valley is all about, is, is marrying the technology with creating markets and creating business opportunities. So I think from an educational perspective, that's, that's one of the things I certainly recommend to young people is getting both sides. Um, you know, don't just be an engineer, don't just be a business major, really try to understand both because if that's the way it is in, in this day and age, it's very hard to do one without the other. The flip side of it is that, you know, there are very few places in the world that you can get almost anything you want. Silicon Valley is one of those places. I mean, it, it may be expensive and it may be hard to, you know, to attract them, but they're here. Uh, and you know, there are a lot of places it's hard to do things because you just can't find the people. Yeah, and that's, that's not just the engineers, it's, it's everything. Uh, the lawyers and the VCs and the manufacturing people. And, yeah, and that's, that's a very good point. Everything ha can happen here much faster. And, than and I think with the, with the change in communications, as Ross said, you know, it is possible to do, uh, you know, people located in a lot of different places more easily today than ever. Uh, and you know maybe a hybrid strategy where you know you do here what you have to do, uh, and you find places like he did in, in Serbia and other places like that where you know it, you can find a very cost-effective capability. Uh, but I think there are lots of strategies that you know you can take advantage of. But Silicon Valley is very hard to uh, you know to to beat in terms of resources and people. I think uh, what I would offer enterprising entrepreneurs is if you're going to do this, don't do it alone. Try and find you know, a team of people that you trust implicitly and who are smarter than you. And that's a really good angle because you know, when, when you get into the trenches, you, know, you need people that can come up with different ideas and, and aren't afraid to you know, tell you that, you know, hey, you're crazy or you can tell them they're crazy uh, because you live together. It's, it's a marriage. And ultimately, you can produce some lovely children from it. Um, <laughs> and, um, well, the other side of it is that you know, a, a good commentary on 3D effects is you have pretty much the initial team here. Uh, and everybody still likes everybody. I mean, there are a lot of startups that you, know, you go through that whole process, and they never want to see each other again. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just a horrible experience. This was a really good experience. And you know, I think we, we all really appreciated what we respectively contributed, uh, and we had a lot of fun doing it. Everybody worked hard, but it was, it was a great experience, and I think everybody you know, came out of it really well. Was it hard being a uh, team of, depending on how you want to count it, three or four co-founders? Because sort of the traditional Silicon Valley model is two co-founders, usually one tech guy, one business guy. Did you find that? at all difficult being three or was there really no frame of reference to know it was? I think we all brought very different uh, skills and perspective. Uh, it would have been very difficult to do the company without each of, of what we brought to the table because um, we, 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 we were very ambitious. I mean, we needed everything from you know, the algorithm side to the chip development side to the business side to the, the software side. side. And so everything. there was really, 
a good, I think it's a good, a good fit. I don't think it ever occurred to us that this wasn't the right model. Um, you know, it, we, we clicked. I think too is a lot of the entrepreneurs that I meet, they get um, so focused on maintaining the maximum equity that they're going to hold in the company that um, they lose a lot of time and a lot of, of um, expertise that they could have, you know, simply by reaching out a lot more. And, and sharing. Uh, and yeah, and, you know, I mean, uh, bringing people on, of course, everyone, everyone in Silicon Valley is going to want equity and going to want a piece of the company. That's just the way that it goes. And um, too often, I think people spend too much time worrying about how much, you know, ownership they have in the company as opposed to, you know, really what you want to do is build a great company and there's, there's plenty of equity to go around and there's plenty of, of upside to be had um, in that regard. But you waste time if, you're, if you try to keep everything, um, you know, and, and think you've got all the answers. Any other concluding thoughts from anyone? Well, thank you guys so much for your time. Yeah, Gary, I know you flew in to come out here. It's very appreciated, and the rest of you guys making uh, the time from your schedule. Um, and hopefully you guys found this uh, fun and enjoyable in much the same way that debugging a chip on Super Bowl <laughs> Sunday is. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.